and we're ready. And now I'll share my my for one second. So you're you're ready to go. It. Um, oh, here we go. Can you see uh, the agenda? Yep, I got it all. The pre-appointed hour of six o'clock having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I wanna welcome everyone to this meeting. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately ac access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting recordings may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with a roll call of the ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Um, Steve Judge is present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Present. In addition, um, Mr. Cochran, uh, as, an, as an alternate member, associate member, is also uh, on the call. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Maureen Pollock, a planner with the town. Rob Mora will be attending. He's the building commissioner. And Maureen, is Dave Washevitz also going to be on the call today? No, it will just be Rob Mora, and he'll be joining us momentarily. All right. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of our most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from this section must be made for all of our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board. During the hearing, after which the board will, be, will ask questions for clarification or for additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and is evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily, for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of the filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the, de the decision with the relevant judicial body in superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, ZBA FY 2022-11, Fearings Sunset LLC, care of, uh, represented by Tom Reedy Esquire request a special permit to allow the construction of two apartment buildings and four, is that the correct, this has been changed. Yes, the two apartment buildings and four duplex buildings, the total of 17 residential units, including two affordable 
see that is the old i took it from the agenda i, I think that's the old the old um description is, is it not maureen you are correct so it's this was the, the uh, yeah. this is the application as published in the public uh notice and legal yeah. ad so that's um, but that's to, fine um you can read this we'll act on um, this yeah yep and it's just being changed that's okay yep, yep. okay so i'll start over um, ZBA FY 2022-11, Fearing Sunset LLC, represented by Tom Reedy, Esquire, requests a special permit to allow the construction of two apartment buildings and four duplex buildings with a total of 17 residential units, including two affordable units and an approximate 2.04 acre property under sections 3 3.01, 3.3211, 3.3231, 3.323, 5.10, 6.29, 10.38 of the zoning bylaw. Located at 164 and 174 Sunset Avenue, Map 11C, Parcels 9 and 299, General Residence RG and Neighborhood Residence RN Zoning Districts. This uh, is continued from May 26th. Also on tonight's agenda is ZBA FY 2022-16 and ZBA FY 2022-15. Killerine Properties, LLC, Care of Valley Property Management request a special permit to allow a non-owner occupied duplex and to request a special permit to extinguish the previously approved ZBA FY 1992-52 special permit under sections 3.321, 10.33, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw located at 80 Pine Street, map 5A, parcel 86, neighborhood residence RN zoning district. After that, we'll have a general comment period on uh, from the public on any matters that were not before the board tonight and then other business that was not anticipated within 48 hours subsequent to that we'll adjourn so the first order of business tonight is zba fy 2020 fy 2022-11 fearing sunset llc represented by thomas r reedy requests a special permit to allow the construction of two apartment buildings and four duplex buildings with a total of 17 residential units, including two affordable units on an approximate 2.04 acre property under sections 3.01, 3.3211, 3.323, 5.10, 6.29, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 164 and 174 Sunset Avenue, mark map 11C, parcels 9 and 299, general residence RG and neighborhood residence RN zoning districts. Are there any disclosures from members of the board? If not, I'd like to uh, summarize our site. Uh, we, we had a site visit before. Um, I don't think we need to go through that. We have not had a site visit since that time. Um, and unless there are any other disclosures or comments from board members, Mr. Reedy, uh, we'd like to have you um, present for the applicant we, this is the third meeting we've had on this, so I think we have a pretty good understanding of the project. Um, Maureen? Oh, you can, um, if you haven't already, I don't think you did, um, uh, state for the record the the submissions provided by the applicant, um, oh, which is yep. highlighted Thank in you blue. Very, yep, it's highlighted in blue. No, I have not done that, and that's why it is so good to have staff. Thank you. So... I have got the old, I have the May 26th project application report. Here's the, here we go, here's the June 16th. So, um, submissions that we've received since the last meeting. Submit to the, into the town record. Uh, we have a series of drawings prepared and stamped by Andrew J. Boleyn, RLA Place Alliance. These include um, an amenities plan, uh, sheet one L100, sheet L400, a landscape plan, sheet L500, a lighting plan, and sheet SL1, light, site lighting photo, photometric schedules and specifications, all uh, dated May 23rd. In addition, we have uh, new model views submitted May 31st. We have email correspondence dated June 15th from Attorney Tom Reedy. We have a project application report from June 16th. We have a breakdown of proposed units by size, bedroom count, uh, prepared by the planning staff. Those are, st this last two are staff submissions. 
And that last one is dated June 15th. Public comment submissions. We did have one today from uh, Anna Butter, uh, Mr. Dick Teresi. Uh, it was dated June 23rd. And I do remember seeing a email. I thought there was one public comment, a new public comment from Mr. and Mrs. Gillen that perhaps was just addressed to board members or emails, but I thought I, I thought there was one additional public comment that I saw, um, which I didn't see in the um, Oh, yeah, the I'm sorry. I, I might not have reflected that in the latest project application report. I believe it is yep. listed on the town calendar. Um, it was, yep. uh, they emailed um, a correspondence, I believe, last week. I, I can't get the exact address, uh, um, date if needed. You can just fill it in for the record, Maureen. That'd be fine. But I wanted to make sure that we noted it. Um, Ms. Parks? I was just going to say, I think you um, missed one of the sheets, um, sheet L300, the site details. Oh, I, I did. Thank you. Um, those are all the submissions that we've had, both public submissions and from the applicant. So, Mr. Reedy. Um, please identify yourself for the record when you speak. Oh, and, and um, Mr. Chair, sorry to interrupt. Um, and I think yeah. there was slight confusion. So Connie and Connie and uh, I forget his his Bill, first name. Bill Gillen. Uh, Gillen. Yeah. They sent an email on June seventeenth, twenty twenty two, and the other person you reference uh, who sent an email today, Dick. Yeah. Uh, Tara C or something. Um, he submitted comments for the other public hearing listed today, not right. for sunset. That's that's correct. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Maureen, you may want to send people uh, members of email the Connie and Bill's Killens um, public comment because otherwise the board wouldn't have benefit of it. So, if you get a chance to email that during the consideration, it'd be helpful. Uh, so, Mr. Reedy, we've had this is our third meeting. Um, and, to, and our third attempt to get to you tonight. So <laughs> there's some there's some symmetry here. Um, uh, lucky three. Well, well, if you don't mind, I'll just I'll keep it brief because this this yeah, is what the I third. Like to, what, what I would like you to do is just to comment on the new submissions because I think we have yeah. a pretty good you know I, have a, I think we have a pretty good understanding of the project. There was a, a list of questions which we can go over and requests and then um, just respond to those as you did and that would be helpful. And then we'll open up to questions from the board. Excellent. Uh, so for the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson here in Amherst here on behalf of the applicant fearing sunset and its application is the chairman noted with me this evening, uh, Andy Bone from Place Alliance, our landscape architect, and Barry Roberts, who is the site developer. Um, I'm also I stayed at the office so that I wouldn't have a, a poor connection because I see Craig's tuning in from Columbia and if he can do it then I better <laughs> not have a worse connection than him so thank you Mr. Meadows for being here uh so yes yeah, so we last hearing we had um modified the plans to eliminate the access onto sunset the model views did not reflect that at the time so we had submitted those so now you have updated model views that actually show the um what, what is going to be proposed save for one change, which I'll talk about right now. We've also updated the landscaping plan. Uh, we had proposed propo uh, proposed 25 arborvitaes, and now we're proposing 25 um, American holly. Uh, I think that was a discussion that Mr. Meadows had. He wanted pollinator, and in talking with Andy, you know, we think there's a lot of pollinator species within the site, but, you know, I, I think having some more probably can't hurt. So we're proposing 25 American holly, I think they're three to five feet at planting. Uh, and Andy, if I'm saying anything wrong, just shake your head one way or another, but I, I think that's exactly what they are. So we have provided that updated uh, landscaping plan. It actually came in after your project application report. Uh, I credit to Andy for turning it around so quickly, but that's, that's one of the other changes. And then we really just updated the landscaping plan and lighting plan to reflect. Um, and I will just share it very briefly so that you can see, because I'm looking at it and, and it probably helps if you're looking at it too. So th this is what it was updated to show. You know, So now, as you'll all recall, we put that sidewalk across, there's gonna be plantings here. So all of these model views were updated to show that the landscaping plan was updated to show that as well. So that's 
any changes to the landscaping plan were really just to bring it into compliance with what the base plan is going to be. And the same thing uh, with the lighting plan, because now, um, you know, we don't have that area right there. And then lastly, the landscaping plan, you'll see called out. And I'll probably do this. So over here, we're just calling out 15 break and then 10. And then that's the, looks like IOX, which is here, which is those American Holly, which are three to five feet of planting. And there's, there's 25 of them. So that was one of the changes that we made, but otherwise really what we did with the plans was just bring it into concert with what we had talked about last time. So really no major changes there. Um, the model views I had just talked about and, and the purpose and what, what they had done. And then I did provide an email because there was some discussion last time and, and Maureen was kind enough to put some of those questions in writing. And, and the first one was, just specifically describe the roles and responsibilities of the management company, the onsite manager and the property manager. And, and so understanding that it's a kind of a hierarchy or a tiered approach, what I did was I went through and talked about how the project's gonna be comprehensively managed by the management company, the onsite manager and the onsite resident manager. The level of discretion and authority without ownership input reduces at each level. So it starts, you know, it's owner, then management company, then onsite manager, then an onsite resident manager where ultimately the decision-making authority rests with the owner, as you'd expect. Management company is gonna be the overall project manager and the owner's representative. And this is really just memorializing what Barry had talked about last time. So we've just put it in writing and, and making it a condition or accepting this submission as a condition, that's fine because this is how it's gonna be run. Um, management company can enter into leases, issue violation notices, begin eviction processes, uh, coordinate move-ins, move-outs, inspect the units, contract with maintenance, landscaping, snow removal crews and, and the like. The on-site manager is going to occupy the on-site management office during weekday typical business hours and be responsible for the day-to-day on-site operations and working with the management company. They'll also use the on-site management office as a leasing office and where residents can go to provide feedback, issues, uh, compliments, hopefully, or, or complaints. Uh, and then the on-site resident manager, and I wanted to make a distinction because Mr. Mora had brought up last time that resident manager is a term of art under the zoning bylaw. That's not specifically what we're looking to avail ourselves of. And I think with this tiered approach, there's plenty of management. Um, so I say, well, it's not a resident manager as defined in the Amherst zoning bylaw. It's a responsible resident that Barry's gonna pick out um, and with input of the management company and the onsite manager to be the presence when the management company and onsite manager are not present. So they'll handle issues like lockouts, alarms, be a point of contact for resident after hours, and we'll inform the management company and owner of, of scene violations. They, we wouldn't expect them to, you know, there is obviously a responsibility of the owner of the management company to go beyond what that resident manager would do. Uh, but at least to have, I'll call it boots on the ground. Uh, that's the idea with that resident manager. So that's um, kind of the hierarchical approach, comprehensive nature of the management, uh, just spelled out as Barry had talked about it last time. There's also a request for um, an explanation of the applicant's goals for providing student, non-student tenant mix. And this was something I reached out to Mark Tanner, who's one of my partners. He's the chairman of our litigation, litigation department. And I said, what do you think about this? Just because there was some concern about Federal Fair Housing Act, Massachusetts Fair Housing Laws, because the, under Mass Fair Housing Laws, it's unlawful to discriminate based on race, color, national origin, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, disability, ancestry, genetic information, marital status, veteran or active military status, age, familial status, meaning children and source of income. So when you get that list, my antenna just goes up and says, I don't wanna put a policy in writing saying we are going to selectively choose or not choose a group of, of people. And so really what we've said is we're, we're, we're relying on the project design, the layout, the infrastructure, the interior finishes, the amenities and the management in support of the of Barry's desire for a well-balanced community development. So we, we just wanted to be sensitive to it. And that's really, if you look at our tenant management plan, you know, we talk about all of those tiers where it really does start with design. You know, you've got this amenity area here. We're going to have, as far as affordable units, as we'll talk about probably a little later, a, a one bedroom, a two bedroom and a three bedroom affordable, which we think is gonna be really conducive for families. 
Um, you've got the parking and you've got the management. You'll have the, the updated interior finishes, the nice interior finishes, et cetera. So we think that with all of that, it, it's and and marketing too. You know, who do you market to? Apartments.com, working with the university, et cetera. That's how you can help to, to define the balance in the community. So that was our response there. Um, a written narrative explaining what happens if and when there's a breach of the lease. And I think in your conditions, you've talked about maybe four different steps that, that would be taken. And essentially what we say is the lease identifies in general and specifically certain expectations about behavior in the community. If those obligations are breached or provisions violated, the applicant has the authority to evict the tenant. We always want to allow the owner to have reasonable judgment and depending on the severity of breach, the overall behavior of the tenant, have they done something previously that was not evictable? Have they done something that was evictable? Have, are they contributing to the community and they just made a mistake this one time? You know, taking all of that into consideration, plus the lawful right to exist, the applicant will, and I think you've got the tiers in uh, your conditions, but there's a, you know, a, a first notice and then it, it progresses from there until you actually go to, and sometimes somebody might do something so egregious where there isn't a notice. It's just a, this is it. Here's your notice to quit. You've got to get out for, for breach of the lease. And the lease has sufficient teeth to be able to do that. The next question was indicate which unit per bedroom count per building number will be affordable. And so what we had proposed was I think a studio one and two town came back and I think Nate Malloy did a good job of identifying a one, a two and a three bedroom. I checked around with Amherst Community Connections, with SEB Housing, with Wayfinders, and they said, I said, you know, because this is our first foray into three bedroom. They said, yep, three bedroom. If you want to do a three bedroom, that'll be fine. So one of your conditions is a one, a two, and a three bedroom affordable unit. The um, one bedroom will likely be in this building, but I would like the discretion. The, all about all the one bedrooms are about the same size. I think it's like 604 to 609 square feet. So there's not a tremendous amount of difference between the two. Um, so it will either be in this building or this building, um, potentially this building right here. And the two bedroom is on the first floor and that's also the accessible unit here. And you'll see, we've got those parking spaces right outside and that kind of checks off the, one of the other questions is which one's accessible. So this first floor here is gonna be fully accessible. That's the two bedroom. And then the three bedroom is also in this building. It's the only three bedroom we have on site. Um, but we think that you know, with the one, the two and the three that we're gonna get a good mix and, and there's, there's a need for each of those. So we feel comfortable you know, providing those. And I think as far as the, the responses to the questions and really what we've done since the last meeting, that's, that's probably a good encapsulation. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Uh, are there questions from the board? Mr. Maxfield. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Do we, do we decide which ones the, uh, the affordable units were going to be, which sizes they were? I was asking for That's some discretion just because I don't know what the HCD is going to want. And what I was, if you're talking about sizes of the, Maybe I'll back up and say, if you want to choose one and two and three, I was thinking within the ones, which of those two um, units, because that, that two bedroom is going to be that entire flat and it's going to be access, fully accessible as well. There is only one three bedroom, so that's the one. And then for the one bedroom unit, the only difference is I think five square feet. And I just don't know which of the two locations would be better. And that's why I just, frankly, just don't know. Oh, good. But it, but it was going to be uh, the, it's going to be one bedrooms. Two of the one bedrooms are going to be the affordables. No, there's going to be one, one bedroom, one, two bedroom, and then one, three bedroom. So each of those, there will be, hopefully I haven't confused you with my language. In no, my no, language. that makes sense. Yeah, I'm not, yeah, I, I don't know which specific ones either, but a one bedroom, a two bedroom, and a three bedroom out of this will be affordable units. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Correct. Thank you. I believe Craig Meadows has raised his hand. Mr. Meadows. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. I, uh, we discussed last time the, um, the possibility of putting in uh, 
vehicle. And I had the opportunity to call the state. And I'm sorry, I can't which department it is, Maureen, I think I transmitted that to you. Um, but when I called them, they a lot of money available. Yes. You're so eager to get it out. Yeah, you know, and I and I should have brought it up, Mr. Meadows. Thank you for reminding me. And I had talked about this with Maureen about providing uh, an EV charging station. And I think that's going to be a condition which I saw. And to your point, yes, I had I had emailed them and they sent back and said, yes, we have we have money. And I said, well, we haven't got our permit yet. And they said, well, supply right after. So we um, it's like, I mean, we'll have, we're fine with that condition of having that EV charging station. So it's not just going to be doing the conduit for it. It's going to be doing it. So thank you for the suggestion. I, I uh, it did something that's probably in some regards, I don't think else. And I noticed that the request now for 5% 5 total parking spaces as preferred parking for any hybrid zero low low emitting vehicles providing minimum parking spaces with hybrid electric vehicle recharge stations now, um, I, mr meadows we're we're getting about every other word right now um but let me try it again maybe shut off your video maybe that will help uh speed your internet Yeah, because we can't see your, your handsome me, face anyway, um, so. Let me uh, put you, stop your video. Try that. Mr. Meadows, are you there? Hmm. I'll well, put his video back on to make sure that we didn't. Losing Maureen, if you could. Hmm. Oh, here you, oh, here he is again. Mr. Meadows, can you hear us? Uh, perhaps um, uh, you could call in. I could email you the um, call in information if that's uh, better. It looks like he has earbuds. Maybe that's uh, he's trying to figure that out. Um, I'll go ahead and email you the uh, phone number to call in if that's helpful. Can you give us a thumbs up if you hear that? Um, you know, there's a way to, you can message him, um, using a white a text message directly. Oh, um, I, I don't see that option here with the, oh yeah, we, um, our IT department, um, has, um, taken that away. <laughs> yes. Too much texting during meetings. No, um, just, uh, because of, uh, you know, in case inappropriate, unfortunately, unfortunately, um, um we don't want any in, inappropriate behavior happening um as maybe you've seen in, in news reports at, at various zoom meetings well uh perhaps uh if craig meadows connection um can be restored he can speak up but perhaps we should just move along and um, we'll check yeah, back we'll, in with him shortly yeah send him that email and then sending, um, yep. we'll get we'll make sure that we he gets a chance to ask his questions about ev Mr. Reedy, did you, did you include one EV recharging station? Yeah, we haven't put it. What I had talked to Maureen about was instead of having our engineer add it to the plan before the hearing, we would just accept the condition of adding one EV charging station to the plan prior to receipt of a building permit. And th th I think that's, that's fine by us. So we'll reserve the right for Mr. Meadows to come back and talk about that at any point that he comes back in. Um, so I have one question. I know you're, you've, um, you and I had discussed last time the possibility of, um, you know, a, a set aside for um, a limit on the number of students. We decided that everybody decided that that probably wasn't uh, a good idea. The town council um, had recommended, but we not take that. So we had talked about in, in, in your response on to the uh, staff's questions, you really said, uh, we need to take a look at the management narrative that gives us some direction as to what you'd like to what, how you want to manage this my cons and and you have um agreed to a demographic um annual report which was something that we talked about which hadn't been done before um 
I've gone through your, your um, management summary, and I had some language that I think is um, additive and not restrictive. And I'd like to share that with you to take a look at that. Just to, uh, if I can, Maureen, can I um, share my screen? Sure. All right. Uh, the language I have would be highlighted in blue. So I'm going to share my screen and I'd like, I wonder if this is something that you would add to your management. This is something you can add to your management plan. It's just in blue. I've taken out the other more precise and, and kind of um, language that would compel you or, or uh, re require you I think to, that's fine. to do that. I think that's fine. Our I have no problem our goal with is that. To be, yeah, that's yep. good. Okay. Thank you. So we'll put that in. So you'll put that in the management plan. And yeah. we'll just, yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay. If you could send that to Maureen, just so I yep. could just pirate it right yeah, from absolutely. there. Absolutely. Put yep. it in. I'll, great. That'll be mailed over. Absolutely. Good. Well, I think we've made some progress on what was a sticky subject. Um, okay. I would prefer that we had more, um, um, more definite and public um, commitment to fewer students, but I understand the restrictions. I understand the litigation committee that you have, and I understand the town, um, and that's just where we are. And I think you guys have done a good job in getting as far as we can towards this. And so I'm happy with that result. Thank you. I think we've moved forward. Um, other questions about the new, um, any new changes from before, from the board members? Did, yes, Mr. Meadows. I think I'm back. Yes, yes you are. Sorry, so, I apologize, but it's, it's not always um, the best of, of communications down here. Um, maybe if I was not in the mountains, that would be better, but I couldn't tell you. Um, I did ask about the hybrid. I, I was reading something from the code about 5% of parking spaces set aside. I don't know if you heard that or not. Parts of it, I understood where you were going. And I guess my response would be, if it's required as part of the code, then I think that we would have to comply. Apparently it is now. Uh, it's in, on, let me see if I can get to it. It's in uh, 974 Mass Reg 3.04. 975, say that one more time. 974 Nine, 974, CMR. exactly. 3.04, it sounds like. So I, I haven't, I don't have any knowledge of it, but if it's if that's a regulation that we've got to follow, then that's a regulation that we've got to follow. I may be misreading it, but it certainly looks like that's a regulation. It also includes something about, uh, about bicycles in here, uh, but that, that's a little bit different. And I think, I, I'm pretty sure you've got secure parking, uh, secure space for bicycles on site. So it, it, I'm, if I remember correctly, that's all covered. Thank you. Okay. And thank, thank you for, for putting the holly bushes in there. Didn't have to be Holly specifically, but I think that's a great choice. I'm, I'm partial to Holly, so I told Andy, I said, Andy, if we're gonna do it, let's just do some Holly. Great. So I think we've dealt with the vegetation, we've dealt with the um, EV and uh, hybrid parking, we've dealt with um, management plan, language. Any other questions from members? If not, um, I'd like to go to public comment. And if I could encourage the public to, if you have spoken on this in the past uh, and you don't have anything to, to speak directly to the changes, I'd ask you if you, uh, if you don't need to speak, you could defer and we could use this time for people who have either not spoken on the project or who have spoken before and want to speak and want to speak to the changes proposed since the first meeting. So do we have members of the public who wish to speak? If so, um, I will start a timer for about three minutes and then um, you can speak. But first, please give us your name, 
and your address for the record. Maureen, do, are we, do we have people raising their hand? Yeah, yeah, so if you would like to speak, please use the raise your hand feature. And it doesn't look like anyone has any public comments to provide. Everybody just a minute. All right, if there's no public comments, um, this is one last opportunity for the board to ask questions of the applicant before we go and, and begin our um, deliberation on conditions and findings. All right, we're gonna move to the uh, conditions and findings section of the, the meeting. Uh, in the past, we've voted on moving into this part, and we're not going to, we do not have to be informed, we do not have to have a separate vote to move into the, the comments, the, the dis deliberation portion of the board meeting. The uh, public hearing portion will remain open, so if we need to have a uh, public comment or a comment from the applicant, we can cite, seek it, but this is really a time for the board to discuss um, how they feel about this and make decisions about how they feel about this application. So I said before, my goal would be first to have a general comment from board members about their feelings of this application and then i'd like to go through conditions uh, look at those and then i think those are um, important because that findings are in my case are always contingent upon the conditions and then we will vote on the conditions the findings and the approval all in one motion at the end um, and if anybody has a separate issue we will deal with with a condition or a finding we'll deal with that separately in a separate vote so first off is uh, general app, general feelings about the application. Um, I'm, I think this is my feeling is that this is, um, was a project that I had, I was skeptical of to begin with. I have come to the conclusion that this is, uh, could be a benefit to, it's well put together and it could benefit the neighborhood. Um, I think that um, the management has shown to be a good management in the past. Uh, so I trust that and I like the fact that they're willing to, um, on an annual basis, not only report um, disturbances and noisy parties and other kinds of violations, but also work with us on making sure that this is a mix that is uh, compatible with the neighborhood. This is a, a um, overwhelmingly single, it's an overwhelmingly residential neighborhood. Uh, most of the homes are, are owner occupied, not all of them. There are lots of students that are living in many owner occupied rental units uh, or duplexes, but it's um, it's a sensitive community and I wanna make sure this neighborhood is not adversely affected by development. And I think we've gone a long ways to ensuring that and we're doing that through conditions in this case. So I'm feeling pretty comfortable about this as long as these conditions that we've outlined are met. Um, I'd like to hear from other people before we go through the process. I personally Ms. think Parks. that this is, Oh, go ahead, Mr. Meadows. Sorry, I was just going to yep. say, I think it's an, a very thoughtful and well put together project and uh, will be a benefit to the community. Um, its placement is uh, is such that it, it, it is not going to detract at all from what, what the community in that location needs. Ms. Parks, you had your hand up. Oh. I was going to say, I don't have any objection other than I think the rents in Amherst in general are too high and continue to be too high. And there is a lot of comment about how there are less families in Amherst. And I'm pretty sure there's less families in Amherst and school age kids because the, the housing is not affordable here. Yeah. And I think, and just to add one thing, I think having affordable units close to downtown um, and especially a three bedroom and a two bedroom uh, to provide the ability for families to live in affordable units and not uh, perhaps stay in our schools, which is something we really hope for. Mr. Gilbert, any comment? Or yeah, Mr. I'd just Max like Gilbert? to add a quick one. You know, I think the applicants done a really successful job here of integrating a lot of public comment, uh, you know, into the design, echoing what Mr. Meadows said. I think this is a thoughtful approach, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, wise design, wise architecture. I think the landscaping is, uh, you know, quite sound. And, you know, I see this being quite a benefit to that corner, um, you know, all things considered, you know, appreciated uh, with respect to 
again, the incorporation of uh, you know, public comments and concerns through this process. Great. Okay. Oh, Mr. Maxfield. Yeah, I'll just add on. Yeah, I think at this point, I'm, I'm definitely in support of this project. Um, three more affordable units, including a three bedroom and a, a two bedroom. Obviously, not going to solve any of the, <laughs> the problems here here in, in Amherst, but will certainly uh, help the people who do end up living in those. And I think this will be a great place for uh, a great place for some some folks to end up. And the um, I think the location uh, is good. I think what's going in that location is good. And, and ultimately, I think, uh, yeah, Mr. Roberts is somebody who does have a good reputation of, of doing things like this in the past that I certainly don't think this is going to be the, the project that derails it. So I, uh, I agree with you, Mr. Chair. I think with the conditions we're going to be putting on here, I think, I think I'm definitely in favor of this project. Great. Well, I'd like to move then to conditions. And as you know, from the project application report, the draft project application report. It's um, it's long. We have, I think, 70 conditions. So the way I want to do this, uh, so it makes the most sense, is go by group. Um, and in order for the public to be informed, I'm going to I'm going to try to summarize each of the conditions. Um, and if it's and some of them I'll read if they're short. But I'm not going to go through and read verbatim each of the conditions allowed. It's available in the project application report. So. The first is project is first group of conditions of project use. Uh, and, and so if anybody has a, before I start, if anybody has an objection to one of these conditions or wants to amend it, um, we will deal with it at the time we, uh, now, let's deal with it now as we move forward. Um, but I think that we should, uh, I think we can probably go through all of these without much in the way of amendment. So project use is a first group, and this is pretty much um, um, standard language uh, that the project has to be built and maintained according to the projects filed with the town. This is pretty much uh, um, well, boilerplate. The second condition, uh, I want to make sure that these you, that this is the correct number of units, 22 units, 53 bedrooms, and the breakout is the same, four studios, four one bedroom, four two, five two bedroom, one three, and eight fours. That's correct? Yes. Um, a new a condition in, is that any future habitable space is proposed in any building basements in the basements of any of these buildings, the applicant shall return to the zoning board of appeals at a public hearing for review and approval. That emerged because of concerns about the basements were probably big enough to have people living in them, but they weren't designated as a living space. I think that came up from one of the board members. Um, the building sh shall not exceed a maximum of two, two stories and a total height. We need a, a number of feet. Here we have two X's. Yes, yeah, uh, so if, if I could, yep. Mr. Chair, so each, um, they're each different based yep. on where that location is in, in your plan. So the type A, the type B, the type C units all have the midpoints called out on them. So as long as we construct substantially in accordance with the plans, then that will bear itself out. So I don't know that you need to put a total of X number because like type A is going to be 30 feet, six inches along Fearing Street, 24 feet, six inches along Sunset, et cetera. So I think maybe referencing the plans might be yeah. better here. Let's, I think that's a, a good idea. Maureen, why don't we just reference the, instead of putting the double X's there, let's reference the plans in condition one. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the units shall be registered and, um, and permitted according to the rental bylaw. The, this permit shall expire upon change of ownership. No more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy each two bedroom unit, each two bedroom unit, each three bedroom unit, or four bedroom unit. Okay, and then you have to up update your lease. So even in that's the town limits are four per unit anyway. So two bedroom, three bedroom, and four bedroom units are all four unrelated individuals. No more than two unrelated individuals shall occupy each studio or one bedroom unit. And then the applicant acknowledges that they have to update their lease to do that. Okay, I see an acknowledgement from the, yes. Mr. Reedy. The street numbers for both dwellings shall be clearly marked in reflective signage. The next is on marketing and lease agreements. 
Lease shall be a minimum of 12 months. Dwelling units shall be by, rented by unit, not by bed. Short-term rental of any residential units shall be in accordance with all local regulations. Lease shall specifically pro prohibit trespassing onto adjacent properties. And any substantial modification to the lease agreement, which may impact tenant oversight as determined by the building commissioner, specifically including minor updates, such as pricing, date modification, clerical errors, or language updates, excluding, not including, excluding minor updates, uh, required by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or other, other government entities shall require the applicant to return to the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting. Affordable units is a long, um, a large number. There's um, 20, 11 different conditions. All of these are pretty much required for the, for the, um, the subsidized housing programs in the, uh, by the state and, <clears throat> and the Department of uh, DH, DHCD. Um, I don't want to diminish how important they are, but I don't think that we have very much choice um, in any of these conditions, uh, which for the most part are um, deal with the process uh, of selecting tenants and, and the process of selecting units. So unless anybody has particular questions on any of these conditions, I'm going to um, you may wish to, if I may, you may wish to yep. just um, review, um, I know we already discussed it, but the inclusion of uh, condition 17, yes, as yep. um, indicated, and then uh, where it says 17C, I think the one affordable three bedroom unit is in building three. Correct. Is that correct? And, then yep. Four, yep. and I have these as 16, but if this is now seven, 16, seven, okay. Yep. So, oh, there were, 16 there were... A, I would just ask, you can, you can do one of two things because all one bedroom units are either in building five or building six. And I just don't know which building this affordable unit is going to be in. So you can either say one affordable one bedroom unit, semicolon, or you can say one affordable one bedroom unit in building number five or building number six. It's going to do the exact same thing. And, and I'm just saying, we just, I don't know which one. It so let's, let's go with or number six. Okay, that great. makes sense. Uh, the second one fully um, in bedroom three and the affordable three bedroom is bedroom six is in unit six or building six, right? Building three. That's building three. Building three. Yep. Building three. All right. Yeah, the two are in building three. All right. Thank you. We'll amend it that way. The rest of it, this is really procedural, so I, I'm not going to go through all of those in, in order to save time. Um, the next is building exterior and site improvements. A lot of these are um, deal with um, things that we always have to impose on um, project of this size. The town engineer and building commissioner shall inspect the construction and entry driveway and all on-site paved areas for conformance with town standards. Utilities shall be underground. The applicant shall provide ad built plans showing building locations, etc. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed so as to be shielded or downcast and to avoid light trespass onto adjacent properties. So that's a, and be, lighting fixtures will comply with our rules and regulations. The building uh, shall meet local required en energy efficiency codes and regulation of the stretch energy code. In addition, low flow plumbing fixtures shall be installed throughout. Any temporary certificates of occupancy shall be approved through the building commissioner. The building commissioner may impose 30 requirements to guarantee completion of the work before issuing a temporary occupancy permit, including for landscaping or top coat paving or other required items that the building commissioner terms may be provided. Um, all utility work and work within the public right of way shall be conducted following regulations and permits from the town of Amherst. Digital CAD plans shall be required for final as built plans for the DPW. These plans shall depict all property lines, easements and utilities, et cetera. Construction permits and associated fees shall be required by DPW to start construction. And they are listed. The final certificate of occupancy shall be issued for any building, shall not be issued for any building or any unit until the final top coat of paving for all driveways and access areas, sidewalks and berms have been completed. Landscaping on the plan of record has been installed and a complete as built plans have been submitted to the building commissioner and the town engineer. Um, Questions on that? Amenities. The entire project site and building shall be smoke-free, non-smoking to the extent allowed by law. 
The applicant shall provide a minimum of one electric vehicle EV charging station on the premises for use of tenants at 164 and 174. The building commissioner may administratively approve any minor changes to the parking layout needed to accommodate the placement and installation of any electrical vehicle charging stations on the premises. And Mr. Meadows, I don't think we need to add anything to meet the, um, if they're required to do, do something additional under, under law, I don't think we need to in, in, impose a condition requiring them to do what they're already required to do. Are you cool with that? Certainly. Great. Okay. The management plan. Um, Move-ins occur between eight and seven. One. Number two, all snow plowed within the parking area shall promptly be removed from the site as part of the clearing process. So you don't have, in many places we have uh, snow berms and places we park snow. Snow has to be removed from this one. Um, all trash pickup, deliveries, and operation of construction and maintenance machinery and landscaping equipment shall be conducted between 8 and a.m. and 7 p.m. The project shall comply and be managed in accordance with all of the management plan. Um, alterations to the plan shall be approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting. If the property or business operations are sold, the new owner shall meet with the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting to review the management plan and to determine if it is still applicable and decide whether or not to hold a public hearing to review and approve the new management plan. That's consistent with what we've done with other non-residential owners, owner uh, property uh, in the last year and a half. As prescribed under the approved management summary and described by the applicant during the public hearing, additional tenant management and approved lease, pertinent provisions of the lease, which if violated constitute a breach of lease, the following steps notices shall be followed by the applicant if and when a violation occurs. First notice, the applicant shall con contact the tenant at the leased unit, informing them that such pertinent provision of the lease is in violation, constituting a breach. Second notice, if the violation of the lease has not ceased, the applicant shall conduct contact the Amherst Police Department, informing them of the said violations and request an Amherst Police Department representative assist in the education and outreach efforts to help change, con change conditions on the premises. Third notice, if said violation of the lease have not ceased, the applicant shall submit a written warning to the tenants of the leased unit, informing them that the said notice serves as their final warning and that such violations shall cease immediately. And the fourth notice, if said violation of the lease have not ceased, the applicant shall submit a written notice to the tenants of the leased unit, informing them that the lease has been terminated and such pertinent provisions of the lease are in violation and they have, have seven days to vacate the premises. The applicant oh, shall log in. Yep. I was just going to say, my only comment might be because I'm as I'm reading this, uh, it says these shall be followed. I would just want the ability to accelerate the process if necessary, right? I, I wouldn't want a tenant to say, well, wait, your condition says you got to give me four opportunities because you never know just what a tenant may do. So I would always want to, you know, so you could always just say, you know, unless the the owner or however the applicant determines that um you know they should move to the fourth notice or something like that right and i think maureen can probably embody that i just wouldn't want to be required to go through all four steps in certain circumstances if you would if it's best just to go right to that fourth one yeah i'm just it's it's more restrictive than what you're you're yeah. saying, but I just, I, I just don't want to take, because right. Lambert Town Law in Massachusetts is something. I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how this differs from what's in the lease. I think we always, under the, under the lease, we always have the opportunity to go to the tenant and say, no warnings, this is it. You know, you set right. your unit on fire or whatever it is, we can evict them right away. What I'm yeah, I, this says the following action steps notice shall be followed shall. by the applicant. So I, that's the only concern to me is a, ten, a wise that. tenant looking and saying, no, 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 yep. you've agreed to go through these four steps. I think this was raised not in order for tenant, I don't think this was raised as a matter of tenant protection, additional protection. No, I, agree. Not, I agree. This is not why that was raised. I think the governing document should be the notice, uh, the lease, um, and which would give you you know, if something is dangerous or is an, uh, a dangerous activity on the part of a tenant, the landlord should be able to remove him immediately, him or her immediately, if it's a dangerous, dangerous thing. Okay, um, I'm fine with so, that then. As long as that's the understanding, we don't have to go through this, then no problem here. 
Maureen, what, um, is that consistent with what we've talked about in the past or the, the shell think, language is? Yeah, let's think on it, it and um, yeah. can we uh, loop back to 45 um, after yep. we finish? When, and perhaps either if Dave or Rob gets back in, um, we can talk about it. So we'll, we'll circle 45, but I think the goal here is not to provide uh, more difficult, it's not for tenant protection. That's provided in the lease and under state law. Um, 46, the applicant shall log and maintain all complaints filed with the property owner, the applicant management company, on-site manager, property manager, and or town of Amherst. So this is the um, log in, uh, of the um, um, complaints filed. There's an annual renewal of the, upon the annual renewal of the rental registration, the applicant shall submit to the building commissioner and an update complaints and violation log report with the Amherst Inspection Services documenting filed complaints and violations, as well as actions taken as defined under this condition and condition 45. Additionally, an update complaint violation log report shall be made available upon request to the Amherst Inspection Services. 48, upon annual review renewal of the Amherst Residential Rental Registration, the applicant shall submit to the building commissioner an up-to-date tenant demographic report that specifically includes a number of students residing in the premise a number of units occupied by students. For purposes of this condition, a student shall be defined as a person, regardless of age, attending or about to attend as an undergraduate, a college or university, or who are on semester, winter, or summer break from undergraduate studies at college or university. All right, uh, with the note, the caveat that we're gonna to return to 45, uh, we'll, let's move on, parking access. Parking shelves occur only on improved services. That's standard. There's 42 on-site parking places. I think that's the correct now the correct number. The parking management plan shall be followed. 26 of the parking places are going to be designated as uh, on the ground. Uh, six, 17 of them are compact spaces and shall be designated by clearly visible signs. All visitor parking spaces shall be designated by uh, the, the, the three ADA compliant park installs shall be designated and clearly marked on the ground with signage. And residential tenants shall be giving parking stickers that are dis that are visibly displayed on each vehicle. Landscaping and signage, the applicant shall replace the 25 Emerald Green Arborvitae uh, located along the eastern property with uh, hollies. I don't, if this is in your landscaping plan, we don't need to do this anymore, right? Correct. Okay. All right, so we can take that out because okay. you are you have to comply with your landscaping plan and the landscaping plan has changed, all right? Um, landscaping shall be maintained by the property owner in accordance with the management plan. Any plantings that die shall be replaced during a reasonable time frame as the weather and season permits with like plant species and shall be planted with the size of the original caliper size at the time of replacement planting. Applicants shall make reasonable efforts to use natural herbicides and non-toxic chemicals, um, give advance warning to tenants, and shall um, the public shall be provided uh, notice regarding application of toxic treatment to any common area used by tenants or the public. All mature trees found within the project areas except those shown on the approved plan shall be removed, to be removed, shall remain, and shall be remained, be maintained as to provide a visual screening from the adjacent properties. Any existing mature tree within the property site that dies shall be removed and replaced with like species with a minimum height of 10 feet and a caliper diameter of two and one half inches to maintain screening. The applicant shall return to the ZBA at a public meeting for review and approval of any permanent signage and, and to the approved temporary sign plan. Storm water and drainage. Prior to starting any work site, the issuing of building permit they provide the building commissioner with, and these are standard stormwater pollution prevention plans and a list of written procedures that outlines the specific operation and maintenance of all measures for stormwater drainage facilities. Construction. Prior to issuance of any building permit, a pre-construction meeting shall be scheduled with the applicant, the contractor, the town engineer, etc. cetera. Uh, this is standard practice. A written construction safety management plan will be provided the approved construction logistics plan shall be provided at the pre-construction meeting and shall cover the following items. Um, they're all, they don't have to be delineated here. 
the approved construction of the logistics plan shall be subject to the following conditions. There shall be no exterior construction activity, including fueling of vehicles on the project site before 7 or after 7 a.m. or after 7 p.m., Monday through Saturday. There shall be no construction on the project site on the following legal holidays, New Year's Memorial, July 4th, Labor, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. The applicant agrees that the hours of operation shall be enforceable by the Amherst Police Department and or inspection services. Parking for contractors shall be restricted to the site no parking on the street, um, hammering or blasting or hammering of rock is a 24 hour notice, um, project sites fenced, appropriate measures shall take place to control dust, um, physical barriers shall be installed for tree protection, tires shall be washed before vehicles exit the site, uh, location of every project related stone water disposal area shall be protected, all catch basins shall be uh, cleaned out at the end of construction and no stumps, demolition material or other construction material be buried at the at the project site. Um, the applicant has to provide the name, address, and business number of the project manager, the applicant, and the uh, engineer of record during the development construction phase shall visit the construction site for all necessary as-built inspection and report to the building commissioner and town engineer. Um, the special permit shall expire within two years of the date that it is filed with the town clerk unless it has been both recorded in the registry of deeds and substantial construction has commenced. That's standard language. The construction shall be completed within 24 months of the date of the issuance of the building permit. If more time is needed, the applicant shall come before the Zoning Board of Appeals at a public meeting for review and approval. So you've got uh, 24 months to get this done after the permit, okay? And no slope created by filling materials shall be finished at grade in excess of a natural angle of repose of the materials. All filled areas which are not built within one year shall upon completion of the operation be covered with not less than four inches of loam brought to finish grade and seeded and mulched in a satisfactory manner. And all materials removed from the project site shall be properly disposed of in an upland area. Those are the conditions, um, 70 of them, uh, 69 of them because we removed one um, that I think are fine. Um, anybody have any problems with any of those conditions? Maureen. Wow. So I have a couple others to add, yep. um, which would be updating the management plan based on the wording that Steve, you provided earlier. Yep. Um, and um, in that um, the applicant shall update the site plan to include compact sign uh, com uh, signage for the compact parking spaces. Yep. Okay. Uh, with a uh, detail or a stock photo of what they would look like. And that um, can uh, the lease shall be updated to address conditions seven and eight, which had to do with the amount of tenants that may occupy um, yep. each of the units by bedroom count. And then if we want to get back to condition 45, wait, hold on a second before, yep, uh, hold on a second, 45 we were discussing. So um, 45, um, that got into that sort of laundry list of uh, first notice, second notice, third and fourth notice, uh, if there was a, um, a breach of the lease. Um, you know, so th that condition was, and as it says, was based, uh, based on the description provided by the applicant uh, during the uh, May 26th public hearing. And, uh, you know, the building commissioner and I, um, you know, wrote, um, you know, worked on cr the creation of this uh, condition and, um, and uh, the com building commissioner um, belie uh, believes that it is important to keep the word shall, you know, if it becomes a may, it's, there's really no, you know, use of the condition. Um, and so that's really the teeth of that condition is that that usage of the word shall. Uh, so the building commissioner um, uh, recommends that the board still consider that that word. And he also um, uh, recommends that the board add uh, the following for serious violations, uh, more aggressive uh, enforcement actions may be taken. Yep, be fine. I'm, I'm yeah, good yeah. with that. Oh, we're, we have no problem with the shall. All, my only point was like nothing herein shall require us to give all of those notices. 
that was the only point, right? We just, and I think you're taking care of it by saying if it's something more egregious, because I just don't, like I said, want a tenant coming back and saying, oh, hey, you didn't give us our four notices. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think what, what Ms. Pollock has suggested is totally fine. We're fine with that. All right, with that amendment, I think we're all good with 45. And um, would the board like to um, entertain um, adding a condition um, to update the lease? We said uh, relative to condition seven and eight, and that was about the bedroom count, uh, about the amount of tenants per unit uh, for each bedroom count. And how about updating the lease uh, as it pertains to condition 45? Um, how would you see that one going? Um, I think that that's starting to get us into that other territory. Like, so we have a lease that says, here's our expected behavior. If you breach it, we can evict you. And then this is kind of like precisely why I was saying, I don't want to have to give them four notices. And then in the condition, you say at max, here's what you do applicant. And if you don't do this, then you're in breach of your pick a number, you know, of your project, which is a big issue. So to me, I would keep it out of the lease. If there is another update to the lease, it probably is in concert with the parking plan so that studios in, in ones and twos only have a certain number of parking spaces and threes and fours have a certain number of parking spaces. That, that would be the only other, and that's per our parking management plan. But I don't know that we add those four notices into the lease because I think that subverts what we were trying to do. Do you currently have steps outlined in the lease for this? You just say if you violated it's our is the lease now you violated it's at our discretion. Essentially, and help me with Massachusetts. Help me with Massachusetts law. <laughs> is there is what is the Massachusetts law? There's, uh, there's no in this like case? number of strikes. Um, so we have a default. So if somebody's in violation of the lease, they technically be in default. And what we would depending on how serious or, or not serious that default is, then we want to leave it to the, the applicant, the management company to say, okay, they've been really, really good. They made a mistake. Let's give them that first notice. And if they do it again, then let's, let's look to evict them then. And the lease is probably a little bit harsher than that is just to say, if you're in default, we have the ability to evict you. And so that's why I don't want to put those four notices in the lease because I actually think that yeah. I think it like, lessens the teeth of the lease. And so as far as the town's concerned, you've got the lease saying one thing and then you've got this, and if, you know, you can only give them so many chances, Barry. And if, if they continue to violate it, then, you know, you're, you might lose your permit. Yeah. Um, I'm in, uh, Maureen, on this one, I'm inclined not to want to put additional restraints on the applicant in removing tenants as long as, we can't violate state law because if you did, they they have an action against them, and and so I don't want to, I don't want. We're not doing anything to reduce tenant rights, but putting this in the lease um, reduces their ability to take action quickly if the need be. Um, with the with the caveat that we have added a um, a serious you know for serious actions as an exemption to this, um, I think we've. I th I think we've uh, solved the problem, um, but I think we create a problem when we put it in the lease. Let's uh, perhaps, I don't know if you have any further thoughts or Dave, or if Rob does, he can explain it, but I'm not sure I understand why we'd want to put this in the lease at this proper time. If, if he's going to be on, if Rob wants to be on later tonight and talk about it, we'll reopen the, we'll certainly reopen it. How's that for resolution for the time being? Um, sure. I mean, it is part of, it will be part of the approved um, documents, um, such as like mm -hmm. the additional tenant management plan yep. and um, I believe the management summary. Um, so that will be a condition of the, of the permit. Um, so at minimum that that will, uh, you know, that will be reflective in those documents and of course in, in the permit here itself. The permit. Okay. And seven and eight. What has to be, you need to update the lease on in terms of seven or eight. So more than no, no more than four unrelated individuals shall occupy each two bedroom unit. 
three bedroom unit or four bedroom and no more than two in one, in studios or one bedrooms. Yeah, and that'll just be unit specific, right? So when there's a one bedroom, then that lease will have a provision in it that says two. no more than two unrelated individuals. A three bedroom will have a lease that says no more than four unrelated individuals. So it's just, it's gonna be unit specific. Is there any concern about that from the staff of the board? It seems to be reasonable as long as you have paid the lease. Okay. Any other uh, questions on conditions? All right. So um, assuming that those conditions are going to be approved in our, our I think we need to we need to make certain findings based on the fact that those conditions will be approved. Those findings begin in section in Article Three, and I'm going to run through the each of the findings. Um, I'm going to try to summarize to the best of my ability those findings. Um, and if anybody has questions about it, please uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Or if there's a clarification, you need a clarification. Um, we will go ahead and, and attempt to provide that. So 3.01, um, the development or operation on a single lot of more than one dwelling or more than one of the principal uses described in section 3.3 .3 is expressly prohibited except where the principal uses are clearly complementary to each other or where they are otherwise provided by this bylaw. Um, we need to determine whether the two proposed residential uses are complementary to each other. And I believe that the four units of on-site, uh, the, the all three of the, all, or I guess all six of the buildings, that the two types of buildings are indeed complementary with each other as they're both residential buildings. Um, 3.3211, non-owner occupied duplex. For a non-owner occupied duplex, one or both dwelling units are rented and neither unit serves as the principal residence of one or more of the owners. No dwelling unit under this use category may be occupied by a total of more than four unrelated persons. Um, the applicant proposes three non-owner occupied duplexes, building one, two, and four, and no more than four unrelated persons are allowed to reside in each unit. The applicant proposes ongoing services of a professional qualified management company. I think they've met the requirements of 3.3211, 3.323 apartment, the site or lot upon which one or more apartment buildings are proposed shall be located close to heavily traveled street or streets, close to businesses, commercial or educational districts in an area already developed for multifamily use. You have no more than three or 24 units. Um, dimensional regulations and no more than 50% of the total units shall be of one size. The proposed apartment buildings are located less than one mile to the downtown Amherst general, general business district and limited district don't zoning districts. The University of Massachusetts Amherst campus is close by across the street and the educational zoning district directly abuts the projects to the north and west property line. The surrounding neighborhood to the project site has a diverse mix of housing types, varying densities from single family uses to multifamily uses. Um, it seems to me that we are, that the applicant meets the requirement that the um, apartment buildings are uh, in a heavily traveled street close to business in an area developed for multifamily use. And Article 5, accessory units. This is, deals with filling of land. Um, I'm not going to go through all the, the um, specific spec specificities of the landfilling, but it's re what this requires is um, certain measures are taken by the applicant and the applicant is not seeking to um, a variance or I mean a, a waiver from any of these and it's the town engineer has approved it. So I, we have, I think we can find that the um, applicant has met the requirements of section 5.10 with the approval of the town engineer and with the plans that they have uh, uh, that they have uh, promised to work to abide by. Article six is dimensional regulations. Um, the one place where they uh, do have a, a technical 
violation is in uh, the fence height. The applicant proposes a six foot high, 180 foot linear modular block retaining wall along the front property of the Clearing Street. The enclosed site plan indicates that the front setback of the said retaining wall at its closest point is 5.8 feet. The front back within the zoning district is 15 feet. Therefore, the applicant requests a section 6.29 modification as it pertains to section 624 relating to the proposed six foot high retaining wall located in the front setback on Fearing Street. So that's that area that runs up along the all on Fearing Street across from the uh, where the, the famous Arborvitae were and now the Holly is going to be. Um, and I think that's just a technical viol uh, violation. We can give a, a waiver from that requirement. Article seven is parking. Um, the requirements for parking, excuse me, generally require two parking spaces per unit. And it, you don't have the two, I don't think you have the two parking spaces per unit. Um, I know you don't have the two parking spaces per unit. The, you've got a parking plan proposing a, the driveways, you've got paving requirements, you've met that. You've met the slope requirements, you've met the setback from the building requirements. Um, you're gonna meet the requirements for designating marking and delineating um, the parking spaces. You have 17 of the 42 parking spaces are, comp are compact spaces. Um, we have a condition on signage for parking spaces that will help to meet the requirements of this section. The existing drive along Faring Street is 15 feet wide at the property line and it's located 50 feet from Faring Sunset Avenue. The applicant proposes to maintain the, the drive widen it to 27 feet um, in order to accommodate a two-way entrance and as well as um, emergency vehicles. Um, they request a waiver, um, seeks a waiver to request exceed the maximum width allowed for a two-way entrance drive allowed at, of 24 feet. This is quite frankly needed um, so that the, for ease of access as well as um, emergency vehicles. So we're, we're, we, would, we would be granting a waiver request from some of the, um, from section 6.106. Landscape standards. Um, I think you've met all the landscape standards. Screening, we'll deal with that in 10.38. Inclusionary zoning. Um, the applicant proposes 22 units, a minimum of three affordable units. Um, one, we got it. I guess we have to change this here. Um, one one bedroom, one two bedroom, and one three bedroom. So that has to be updated in the. Um, so I think that didn't include the, the three bedroom unit, uh, the project application report. Okay. So I think we've met the requirements for the inclusionary zoning, and now we're moved to section ten point three eight. Those conditions of which we are more familiar. Uh, this proposal is suitably located in a neighborhood which is proposed and or in the total town is deemed appropriate by the special grounding authority. Um, I think it's the judgment of the board that this project has been designed to fit into the residential uh, context of the neighborhood. 10.382, 10.383, 10.385, and 10.387 do not constitute a nuisance due to air, water pollution, dust, vibration, lights, or visually offensive structures or site features. Um, it doesn't create water pollution, doesn't create a unreasonable levels of noise or light. Residential buildings are uh, conforming to the neighborhood or are good looking. We have dark sky compliance, uncast lighting, and it's appropriately screened. It's not a hat. The um, traffic impact statement says it is not, um, will not be a, ha a burden on the neighborhood. The proposal eliminates a curb cut on Sunset Avenue, so we'll so have two full access curbs with the introduction of a sidewalk on the westerly side of, of, um, just of one, Sunset Avenue. Just I don't, you just have action. one, yeah, I'm confused yeah. about this. Just, yeah. just one cut, because we got rid of the Sunset Avenue cut, right? right? Yeah. All right, so just one full access cut, okay. Um, all right, so I think we've met the, um, 
requirements of 10.383, 8385, and 387. 10.384, adequate facilities provided for proper, of, proper operation of the proposed use. Um, the management plan adequately deals with the, the building and identifies areas for storage of waste and recycling. Appropriate facilities that have been and will continue to be provided according to the management plan. Um, and the applicant here has, has a track record of great property management. 10.386, the proposal ensures that it's in conformance with parking signs and regulations. I think we've met that, um, especially with the conditions that we've imposed on parking. 10.387, the proposal provides convenient, safe vehicular travel within the site and adjacent streets. It is safe, we find it is safe, convenient vehicular and pedestrian traffic within the area and the traffic impact statement um, submitted by the Santec Corporation. Um, it's a nominal impact upon overall areas, uh, overall traffic in the area. 10.388, the proposal ensures adequate space for off-street loading and loading of, of goods and services. There's adequate space. 389, proposal provides adequate methods of disposal for sewage, et cetera. The management plan, I think, deals successfully with that. 10.390, the proposal ensures protection from flood hazards um, in section 3.228. Uh, um, it's not located in a flood zone, um, but there's a construction logics plan that deals with this with the stormwater management plan. Uh, the town engineer confirms that the stormwater planning uh, meets uh, their, their needs. 10.391, the proposal protects to the extent feasible, unique or important historic features um, I don't know that there's any natural resources or or uh, historic features that needed to be protection, but the two pre-existing 1950 homes are going to be relocated um, in, and it's received a certificate of appropriateness from the historic district. 10.392, the proposal provides adequate landscaping, et cetera. Um, lots of landscaping here. We've had, we've reviewed that extensively, um, 400 shrubs, uh, 1,000 square feet of conservation, 79 trees, and it's appropriately landscaped. 10.393, the proposal provides protection from adjacent properties by minimizing the intrusion of lighting, et cetera. We've got a photovoltaic plan. We've got uh, downcast, dark, uh, dark sky compliant lighting, uh, and there exists screening for adjacent properties. 10.394, the proposal avoids the extent feasible impact on steep slopes. This is not applicable. 10.395 does not, the proposal does not create this disharmony with respect to the train use scale and architecture of existing buildings in the vicinity. Um, looking at the, the, um, the architecture of the homes, they fit very nicely within the Lincoln Sunset Historic District. Um, and the, they have reviewed, the, the local historic district has reviewed the proposed architecture and the uh, applicant has uh, adjusted the architecture to their comments. 10.396, the proposal provides screening for storage areas, loading docks, uh, there's appropriate storage for dumpsters, et cetera. Proposal uh, 10.397, adequate recreational facilities. They've added recreational facilities, both on property and for bicycles and other areas and other um, recreational activities. 10.398, the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of this bylaw and the goals of the master plan. It is indeed in harmony with the general purpose, um, the goals listed in the project narrative. The proposal additionally is consistent with the goals and objectives of the master plan. The proposal furthers the goal of the master plan objectives as set forth in H1, 2, 3, 6, uh, T2, and LU1. Um, additionally, the project acknowledges and seeks further Amherst transportation plans, ideas of non-auto-oriented development due to sitting on siting on the project, provision of bike racks, proximity of PVTA and the bike path. And in addition, I would say that the uh, willingness of the applicant to report to the town on the demographics, as well as their uh, willingness to um, maintain the compatibility in the neighborhood speaks to the um, meeting the local needs and the master plan as well. So I find the, I, my recommendation is that with based on contingent upon the conditions that we have discussed, we can make the findings required under our uh, bylaw in order to approve this project. And 
barring anything on 45, which we have not been able to get further. Uh, is there any further discussion from or any information from Rob anymore on, on number 45? If not, okay, Maureen, then no. um, I'm prepared to entertain discussion on that motion and uh, on the uh, approval and uh, hear a motion to so approve it. Um, and if so, I, the motion I would like to hear, and we can debate that motion, is to move to close the public hearing and to approve or deny the special permit to allow the construction of three apartment buildings and three non-owner occupied duplex buildings with a total of 22 residential units, including three affordable units on an approximate 2.04 acre property under sections 3.01, 3.211, 3.323, 5.10, Six point two nine seven, seven point zero one one zero four, seven point one zero six, seven nine point nine, eight point five, ten point three eight, fifteen point one, and fifteen point one six of the zoning regulations. Located at one sixty four one seventy four Sunset Avenue, Map eleven C parcels nine and two ninety nine, general residence R G and neighborhood residence R N zoning district, with conditions. So, is. Will somebody make that motion? Oh, Ms. Pollock. Uh, you may you want to comment? specify whether this motion is to approve the special permit. It's, it's either one or the other. Oh. So it doesn't sound like you're entertaining to deny it, but that is, you know, the option to it. approve or deny. So you might want to oh, pick to one. Oh, I thought I, I thought I said approve. Okay. I will restate the first sentence and I'm not gonna go through the rest of it. I make a motion to close the public hearing and to approve the special permit. Okay, so I read the old thing of like, insert your name here. I read both approve and deny. <laughs> 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 and yeah, I've, I've, people have done that before. Okay, um, is, is, is there somebody to move that motion? Mr. Maxfield, is there I a second? I such a motion, so moved. Is there a second? Okay. Ms. Parks, is there any discussion on the motion? If not, uh, the roll, uh, a vote occurs on the motion. This is a roll call vote, and it requires four people to approve the motion. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Oh, you're muted. You're muted, Mr. Meadows. Aye. Thank you. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Motion carries. Motion's approved by unanimous vote. Uh, congratulations. Thank you very and much. I'll... Thanks for all the work. We really appreciate it. And I want to congratulate the members. This was uh, a lot of work. Thank you very much for all your work on this one. Thank you very much. Good luck. All right. Um, does anybody need to take a break real quickly before we enter the next uh, matter? I'm just going to have to get my paperwork right before we move on. Um, I'll be back in like 30 seconds until you run uh, restroom. All right, everybody. Why don't we all take uh, a couple of minutes and we'll be and we'll start on the second application.
we're back. I guess we can start the um, next item on the agenda. The next item on the next order of business is ZBA FY 2022-16 and ZBA FY 2022-15. Killerine Properties LLC, represented by Valley Property Management, requesting a special permit to allow a non-owner occupied duplex and to request a special permit to extinguish the previously approved ZBA FY 1992-15. 52 special permit under sections 3.3211, 10.33, and 10.38 of the zoning bylaw, located at 80 Pine Street, Map 5A, Parcel 86, Neighborhood Residence RN Zoning Districts. Are there any uh, disclosures? If not, uh, I'd like to summarize the site visit um, on Tuesday, Tuesday, I think it was. We walked the site, or was that yesterday? I, we walked the site, um, met the, the property manager, uh, walked the property, um, observed the, the parking area, um, looked at the, the building from the outside, the portion that was going to be demolished, proposed to be demolished, we observed the barn that was proposed to be demolished and where there's going to be um, some um, natural plantings um, to reclaim the area after the barn is just demolished with uh, wild blueberries. We observed the, uh, we walked around the house and observed the siding. Uh, we asked a question about whether the siding was going to be replaced um, and uh, the clapboards were going to be replaced. And the, the representative said yes. We uh, entered the house, uh, the, the three bed, the current three bedroom unit uh, was unoccupied and we viewed that. We went upstairs and viewed the bedroom, the downstairs. And then we uh, went into the uh, one bedroom unit um, to the side, which was currently occupied, uh, including the portion of that building, uh, that, that unit that's going to be incorporated into the four bedroom duplex and, and a new, the new duplex is being built next to it. Um, that was about it in terms of describing the site visit. Is there any questions? And Tammy, uh, Ms. Parks, you were, were there earlier than, than us. Did you have anything to add uh, beyond that from your site visit? Um, I did look at um, how the house was situated or the yard next to the river, uh, oh. which is just, just behind the property. Okay. And I think that was pretty much that was pretty much it. Uh, so that summarizes our site visit. Um, I want to go through current submissions. Submissions include um, an application, uh, a management plan, an additional ref photos, a project description, sample parking permit, and a sample lease. Um, details and specifics for spec specifics for exterior light fixtures, site plans, including plan of land signed by Timothy B. Armstrong dated 20, April 20th, 2022, sheet L1, existing conditions dated 2020, April 20th, 2022, sheet L2, um, a site plan dated April 20th, and lighting photometric plan dated April 20th, as well as a set of building plans all dated April 19th, going from sheet A1 to sheet A6. Um, ZBA FY, FY 2022 applicant submissions, um, application and the previously approved ZBA special permit from 1992-52. Um, Maureen, was there anything where Beyond this, beyond the project applicant, that's not on the project application report that you received from the applicant, or is there anything else that we need to receive that we're anticipating? I don't, I think that is it. Um, but if the applicant, um, uh, the applicant and I had sort of a back and forth of um, a slight confusion of submissions. So it, if in now or during the tonight's public hearing, if the applicant, um, 
notices something that may be missing, he can indicate and um, um, and present it. All right. Um, so planning staff submissions include property map, an aerial map, a topography map, a zoning map, and project application report dated June 23rd. Uh, the applicant also has a waiver request from a sign plan. Um, and lastly, we did have one um, public comment that we did receive, which I mistakenly referred to in the previous comment of uh, previous application from uh, Mr. Teresi, um, maybe? To, Teresi? Yeah, Mr. Ter yeah, Dick Teresi and his wife, um, Dick Teresi and his wife that came in today. Uh, that both that asked questions mostly was asking questions of Maureen. But if you haven't, but then um, uh, he uh, he did ask <laughs> questions, and, um, and I responded to explain it. And then he stated um, yeah. at two fifty three that him and his wife have no objections to the two proposals. We live next door right. to seventy two Pine Street, and yep. although we have never met the current owners during the past several years, the op occupants of the house have been curious, quiet, respectful, and obtrusive great neighbors. They exhibit the New England tradition of respect for privacy. So that's the only public comment uh, we've received so far. Correct. Okay. So, um, Mr. Santoli, will you would, uh, identify yourself for the record and present, you're there for the representing the applicant, correct? Oops. You need to unmute or there you go. Thank All you. Right. Yes, I am here to represent the applicant. Yep. Can uh, my we have is, your name? My name is Alan St. Hilaire of Valley Property Management. Our address is 35 University Drive in Amherst. Great. Um, one other thing that I want to do before we give you the, the floor here is um, lately we've been, which I think is really helpful, We've been getting complaint history reports. Uh, the town staff has looked at rental property complaint history reports. Um, and I think that's helpful for us in making our decisions on some of these special applicants, for, uh, special permits, which include rental housing. Uh, in this case, uh, there have been no, no complaints filed since 2018 when the current owner took over the property. Previous to that, there were several you know, in 2017. Um, in 2016 and 2015, um, but those there's been none since the current owner has owned it in 2018. All right, Mr. St. Hilaire, go ahead and make your presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, board members, Maureen, I appreciate your time on this, Mr. Wiskevitz. Uh, just wanted to introduce myself briefly in case anyone's unfamiliar. Uh, been a property manager since 2006, and I've worked with this applicant since October of 2019. Uh, so we have a good working relationship and uh, enjoy the same with the town. Um, the present condition of the property, as was mentioned and is in the application report, is a duplex. Uh, it's a three bedroom unit in the front and a one bedroom unit to the rear. And, and under the current regulations, we could have up to six residents, uh, so four in the front and two in the rear by square footage prescriptions under the Health and Building Code. What we're proposing is to increase that by two tenants up to eight tenants via four bed, four bed on either side of the duplex. Um, with that being explained, I'd like to jump into the site plan and just review the proposed changes. Um, so let me get that brought up here and see if I can share it. All right, so site plan was prepared by Berkshire Design Group. And um, the current conditions include the house, which in the front southerly section is two stories. The rear is a single story and a wood frame barn with a patio to the west of that. 
There is sufficient parking uh, on site already. We are not proposing any changes to the parking area. Uh, moving to the demolition plan, what we are proposing to do, and this was, uh, I'll note, was approved or was not opposed, I should say, by the Historical Commission, which has reviewed this at a public meeting. Uh, would be to remove the barn and remove the single story uh, appendage off the north side of the house, which would then make way for the addition, which would be a Cape Cod style story and a half would offer two levels of living space um, in a very similar footprint, a little bit broader. And the area where the barn was located will be restored with, um, you know, bring soils up to existing grade on either side of it, uh, plant it with um, grass, wildlife mix, and also uh, blueberry bushes. This was also approved by the Conservation Commission. Uh, and lastly, the lighting is all dark sky and. Um, downcast and does not trespass on the neighbors. Uh, there will be three proposed light fixtures. Uh, the larger light fixture, which is type one in our submission in the cut sheets, will uh, illuminate the parking area to the east. And then there are two type two light fixtures, which are the smaller variety with a smaller light pattern which will illuminate off the south facade of the existing structure, the parking area and walkway to the south, and another type two light fixture, which will be located adjacent to the entrance of unit B, which will illuminate the walkway uh, approaching both units. Uh, the primary entrance to unit A is to the north side here, uh, and as such to the east side of the addition. So all areas of approach and parking will be properly lighted and screened from the neighbors and downcast. Uh, the other thing that I will show you is uh, in terms of the architectural plans. And just to illustrate the visual impact uh, from the public view, and that is best shown by this south elevation here. Uh, all of this area is the existing facade of the building. There is a small section, approximately two feet across, that would be exposed to the, the southerly viewer, which is the public way. Uh, but it is screened from the public view by existing established trees and bushes. So everything we're doing to the north side of the house is, is not visible with the exception of this small area to the west, uh, which is, in my opinion, screened away from public view. Uh, I believe that covers our proposal at a high level overview. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions from the board to clarify any of this, or if I've omitted any uh, fundamental information, happy to submit that. Um, Mr. Hilaire, um, I understand that currently there are, there are uh, four units with um, three in one building and one unit in the other building that's gonna be demolished. So you have, and you're proposing to have eight units at the end of this, four in the yeah. first building and. I, I think you might mean bedrooms. Bedroom, I mean bedrooms. Two units, four bedrooms, excuse me, that's right. Two units, four bedrooms. Uh, so for a total of of, um, of of eight of eight bedrooms, is that correct? That You've is correct. We've gone from four to eight. So we'll go from four to eight bedrooms. That is correct. All right. Um, secondly, when was the when was the Conservation Commission? I know you're within the 200 foot perennial stream, and I think you mentioned that the Conservation Commission approved the 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 uh, the plan or gave it a no a, a no problem. Did that occur in April or did that occur more recently? Uh, let me find that. I thought you said there was something last night that you went to a, a meeting of one of the. That, 
that was the historical commission that, that was a historic commission did not express any opposition to the demolition okay so you've met the you previously had met the requirements of the conservation commission that's correct okay um one of the items we looked at and that you commented on at the site visit was the um the condition of the siding and the clapboards uh they could they were um they needed some work a lot of them were, were bad and you were going to replace those uh, is that still the intention of the applicant to replace the siding when once the work has begun yes the the intention is to uh reside both the existing building and the proposed building uh, it will be done via uh, vinyl siding clapboard uh, style four inch you know exposure uh, in a consistent color uh, most likely white although we haven't discussed uh, mm -hmm. with the owner you know color choices but yes it will be one consistent siding in in good condition once the project is completed and would you be a would, would you be opposed to a condition that said that you had to have completed uh, siding within two years of construction of the new project, new property? No, I don't think we would, no. Okay. Maureen, I think that'd be um, a good condition. It would certainly add to the um, attractiveness of the house versus what uh, is there today. Um, are there other questions from board members? I guess I would have one more question. You're asking us to extinguish an old um, 1992 special permit um, and issue a new special permit, uh, which is, you know, can you give us the, your reason for asking for that rather than just amending the, the existing special permit? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, the, the, the way this came about, uh, I originally reached out to Mr. Weskevich to ask him what our options are uh in expanding this property and the answer was that because the current special permit has a condition that requires uh that there are no exterior changes and we are proposing exterior changes uh and i believe i could be wrong but i believe that the uh the uh options within the zoning bylaw had changed from 1992 to present such that uh, non owner occupied duplexes were allowed. Uh, I believe that the the way it was explained to me was that the, the path to permit uh, of most simplicity was to uh, file under the non owner occupied duplex. Um, and then when we did submit that application, uh, Ms. Pollock explained to me that we would need to just go through the uh, the procedure of requesting that the old special permit be extinguished in order for the new special permit to be issued and approved. Got it. Mr. Wyshevitz or Ms. Pollock, do you have any comment on that? I do recall that conversation, but I have not really participated in that discussion since that discussion. Um, I think it might have been more with uh, Ms. Pollock and Mr. Mora. Um, uh, yeah, so under the special permit uh, from 1992-52, I believe there was a condition that said there shall be no exterior changes to the structure. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the applicant is proposing to demolish a portion of the existing house as well as uh, the detached barn in the rear of the property. And uh, so that's one factor. Um, that 1992 special permit was to was the approval of a single family home to convert to convert a single family home uh, to allow a second unit. So uh, uh, so there would be a total of two units, which is there presently. So that's under mm -hmm. the converted dwelling section. Because of the uh, A, because of that condition that says there shall be no exterior changes to the structure, and B, because of under the converted dwelling section under, under the zoning bylaw standard five, there is um, language that limits the amount of demo demo uh, demolishing of a of an existing structure and adding an addition, and so. Uh, the applicant with, you know, speaking with staff felt that it was uh, sort of a cleaner process um, 
And I, I don't, th he would not be allowed to amend the uh, converted dwelling special permit um, because of standard five and because of that condition. So there would be no permit pathway for amending that special permit. Um, and so in the case that there is no pathway under the converted dwelling to uh, for amendment or for or for new construction, um, the the zoning bylaw allows for an applicant to propose uh, a non-owner occupied duplex as a as another use uh, classification, and so that that is what the applicant is doing. So they're they're gonna de uh, reclassify the use type there from a converted dwelling of the two existing home two two existing units to a new use classification, which is a non-owner occupied duplex. And in order for him uh, for the applicant to do that. You know, the board needs to make their findings to approve that special permit for the non owner occupied duplex. Um, and then, contingent on that, the applicant would is asking that the board um, grant a special permit to extinguish that 1992 special permit. So that would be um, cease and void. And so, the only uh, if tonight's special um, duplex uh, proposal is granted, that would be the only special permit that is valid. Thank you. That's particularly helpful because I, um, I've not been on a panel that extinguished a uh, special permit, so I now understand why. Um, are there questions from members of the board to the applicant? Mr. Meadows. Meadows. Yeah. Um, again, maybe this was. Uh, it just happened that I was reading some of the regs this morning, and maybe uh, Mr. Wiskevitz could uh, elaborate on 974 Mass Reg 3.04. Indicated a number of things that are required um, as far as uh, both space for bicycles and also providing a minimum of 5% of total parking spaces with hybrid vehicle plug-in chargers and providing 5% of total parking spaces as preferred parking for hybrid zero low emission vehicles. I, I, I don't see that as part of this application. Am I misreading that? Well, I will, I mean, Al, uh, Mr. St. Hilaire could point it out. The applicant does propose a bike rack Adjacent to the parking area and along the walk walkway, um, as indicated in the previous public hearing, um, you know, if there are um, state or local or federal, uh, you know, regulations that need to be followed, of course, the applicant would need to, uh, you know, that would be an automatic requirement, um, and so. Right. You know, I'm not um, Dave with Skevitz and and uh, the building commissioner can certainly look into that particular um, building code um, that you're referencing um, and, it, um, you know, tomorrow um, to uh, to confirm that that it would be indeed a requirement. But I, I don't believe that the board needs to make a condition under this special permit. You know, if the code makes it has a requirement then the code has a requirement and that would be captured under the building permit um, approval process. So Correct. I don't think you need to- It's just that um, I don't see it in the plan. It, it requires a covered and, and lockable space and that is not made provision for here. In other words, we don't see it. It's not in the site plan is what you're saying? Or the Alan? It, uh, just for my own clarity, is, Mr. Meadows, is this something you're referring to as a section of the building code? Ooh. The audio cut out, I'm sorry. Uh-oh, am I off? No, you there were you go. again. Okay, uh, 974 Mass Regulation 3.04. I'm unfamiliar with that regulation, it, and I, I'm thinking it may apply to uh, projects of a much larger scale. It doesn't have, didn't seem to have a limit of the size or a minimum size. 
uh, as far as my reading was concerned, that's why I'm asking for Mr. Wiskevich to take a look at it and see, because it, it would seem as though it's applicable for almost everything that we look at. Yeah, I'll gladly take a look at that tomorrow. I don't have it in front of me, and I'd, I'd like to know for sure for the next time, of course, as well. Mr. Thank Mr. you. Can you repeat that section one more time so I can also research it? Sure. Four. Uh, Regulate three zero four. Uh, Lost uh, on the audio again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's try so this again. Can you, can you send an email to Maureen with the the site uh, cited, <laughs> and then she can pass it on to Mr. Saint Hilaire. Yes. Great. So I, I guess. In terms of this question, um, I don't know if we should, we can, we can talk about the stern conditions, but if it's, if it's required by state law or by state regulation, I don't know that we need to impose it at this time, but we need to know about it so that it's, we expect it in future drawings and future site plans. And um, Mr. Wiskevich will get us up to date on it um, and keep us informed on what we need to do. Yeah, and, and I would like to add that, you know, your your boilerplate condition number one, and I can jump to that um, yeah. one second. It's, uh, I will, I guess I'll read some of it. Uh, the, pro, you know, that gets into the project shall be built, maintained and managed according to the approved plans and application package. Any changes shall be reviewed by the building commissioner to determine if submission to the ZBA is necessary. The changes may be reviewed and are approved by the ZBA at a public meeting or the changes are significant enough to require a formal modification of the permit and or condition and or condition. And so, you know, sort of not to say worst case scenario, but like, you know, if, you know, Dave Wetzkevitz tomorrow reads the code and, you know, suddenly Alan needs to do A, B and C to accommodate, uh, f um, uh, accommodate for hybrid vehicles and their, uh, which would, uh, you know, theoretically maybe, um, change the layout of the parking area, he would have to submit that, uh, you know, he would need to speak to, you know, the building commissioner and the planning department of what changes would need to be um, provided on that site plan. And, you know, if there are minor enough changes, the building commissioner, you know, may um, determine that they're minor enough. And so it could be administrative approval, or if, you know, the parking layout um, changes if 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 there were changes needed, um, and they were significant enough, it would come back to the ZBA for review and approval at a public meeting. So that condition, your boilerplate condition, sort of protects um, you know any changes to the layout of the parking area or amenities provided. Um. Mr. St. Hilaire, can you bring up the, um, the floor plan of unit A? Is that now visible? But yeah, but do you have do you have a floor plan? Yeah. Yep. There we go. So this is the proposed floor plan, uh, which I can zoom in on a bit so that it's more legible. Uh, first floor, two bedrooms, kitchen, living room, bathroom. Second floor two bedrooms and a second bathroom. Okay. Go. Master bedroom, go back to the first. So in the back, there's a, a, a room designated a dining room that has a door located on it here. Um, 
So we, you have four bedrooms and a dining room and with a door into the you have one, right? You have three more bedrooms after this. And if this dining room potentially could be used as a bedroom, if there's a door there, if the door is not there, the dining room is the room labeled dining room is less likely to be used as a bedroom for an effect of fifth bedroom. I think if I'm reading this correctly, would, um, would you be willing to take that door out so that we're not having this potential for a, a fifth bedroom in the four bedroom unit? Yeah, I don't, I don't see an issue with that. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Maureen, we can make that a condition. Um, another question I had that was identified by Maureen. And so I appreciate this Maureen is, is it, is it identified in the management plan as to who's supposed to be responsible for snow and ice? And so have you identified a tenant or is it going to be a, a company that takes care of it? Yeah, thank you for that question. I, I did have a chance to review the project application report. Uh, the, the confusion lies in the fact that our lease, our sample lease, uh, applies to uh, a number of properties that we manage, and then those terms and conditions under tenant and landlord responsibilities are updated per the property specifics. So in this case, it would in fact be the landlord's responsibility for snow and ice removal. Okay. So. Um... That would be the condition of the lease at the property? Yes, that would be and the that, lease for the property. But it's not in the lease that, that the lease that you submitted would be, is, if that's not clear. So perhaps we just have a, a quick condition that clarifies that the lease for this property has a, um, has the landlord responsible for snow and ice removal. Happy to do that. Okay. And so I would that. add that the lease shall be updated to indicate uh, that it's, at the responsibility of the um, le leaser or owner, landlord. Yeah. Okay, I'm just writing this down. And, and dining room door. Um, on your lighting plan for the um, lighting fixture type is proposed over the unit B's door entrance along the east building wall, also identified by our sharp eyed staff. Um, can you pull up the, the lighting plan? Uh, thanks for pointing that out, uh, Ms. Pollock. The uh, the question is this this light here uh, adjacent to the entrance to the proposed unit B. Uh, what what type is that? And uh, it it is properly shown on the photometric to be type two. It's just not labeled as such. So it, it will in fact be the type L two from the lighting uh, cut sheets provided. Okay. And you'll update the uh, the plan to, to do that. I'm happy to do that. All right. So we'll have that also an updated lighting plan. All right. Um, Ms. Pollock, you identified an issue regarding the amount of uh, small parking signs provided. Can you describe the concern that you, or the question you wanted to raise with that? Oh, yeah, um, it, it, um, it had indicated that, it, I was a little confused um, whether signage, it, oh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm doing two things at the same time. Um, so I believe the application said that parking spaces shall be designated to each specific unit and will be marked by small signs in front of each space, i.e. reserved for unit one. And then also all um, tenants would have like a parking sticker 
um, you know, the building commissioner and I uh, questioned whether um, is it redundant or sort of a visual eyesore to have eight individual small par uh, signs um, to say, you know, reserve for unit one, uh, A versus reserve for unit B. And uh, we we're uh, suggesting that, you know, you could just have one, you know, one or two signs that say, uh, reserved for tenants of this property. All uh, all other vehicles will be towed. Um, the applicant isn't proposing any guest parking spaces. Um, just so, just to you know, reduce the amount of signs on the property um, was sort of our suggestion. Mr. Sandler, uh, that we have no issue with that uh, in the application. I apologize if the language was. Uh, Confusing, but in the application, we would only uh, install signs if if the board so requested. So we're happy to have fewer signs. Uh, it, that has worked well in other properties that we manage. We will include the parking plan, uh, distribute that to the occupants so they know where they should be parking, uh, and that has worked well on other properties. So we're happy to have be void of any signs or all signs. I do think that the resident. A single resident only sign could certainly be appropriate, um, but we, we are not asking for any additional signage, uh, that anything beyond what the board would feel to be appropriate. So I think what's a bare minimum here is that it's a resident parking only. You don't have, you only have eight spaces. Um, and if you want, if you wanted to delineate it from eight unit A and B, that's fine. I guess what I would say is that unless a board member has a strong feeling about this, submit a, um, a narrative of a, of a parking plan to the building commissioner and just work with he and Maureen on what makes the most sense for that. I mean, I think you both have the same goal. I don't see a need for us to try to mediate that and it can be handled by a, a conversation and an email exchange between the, the commissioner and you. Sure. Does anybody have a problem with that? Any board member have a problem with that? I think that would work out well. Okay. That's the extent of my questions. Um, any other board member questions? Yes. Um, I'm just Pardon. hoping that, that you can improve the, um, the address signage on the road. Um, right now, it's very hard to tell uh, the number of that property. Yeah, I I second no that. I had a hard time finding it too. So I I hate to be a um, an ambulance on a dark night. So when you're dealing with the parking sign, um, conversation with the building commissioner, present to him also a a, a, a mock up of a sign for uh, the address off the street. Sure, I, I okay. think that could certainly even be accomplished by, uh, you know, four inch tall lettering on either side of the mailbox. I believe the fire department requirements are four inch tall lettering and we'd be happy to, you know, comply with that both on the mailbox at the edge of the road and also at the uh, facade of the structure. All right. Any other questions or comments from board members? Anything from the staff? You need anything more, Maureen? You got what you need? Good. Okay. Um, if there's no other question from board members, we should open it up to public comment. Maureen, do we have you, uh, you. Mr. St. Hilaire, you can, uh, you can close off your, your uh, sharing. And we, we have can uh, um, John McLaughlin, M M McLaughlin. Sorry, I might be mispronouncing your name. If you could state your name and your address. Um, yes, this is uh, Attorney John McLaughlin. I'm at uh, Green Miles Lipton in downtown Northampton. Uh, um, I can't be seen. Is that um, is that intended? It is. I... it is. Yep. Okay. Fine. Fine. <laughs> you don't need to see me. I'm ugly. So, um, <laughs> so, so uh, um, I, I have to apologize. I was retained today. Uh, by the direct next door abutters. My clients, Carmen Rolon and Roberto Alejandro, 
and they own 84 Pine Street, which is the property to the east. Um, as you look at the property, it would be to the right of the on the plans. Um, they're longtime residents of this neighborhood. Uh, they built their home in the 1990s. Um, and they see this uh, district um, and the street as having mostly owner-occupied homes. Um, there are a few um, multifamily, and many of the multifamily are themselves owner-occupied. Um, they've had a problem with this um, property as it exists um, under the applicant. And I believe if you look at the prior owner, if you look at the deed into the um, into this um, current applicant, I believe the deed into him is from the principal of the uh, LLC that owns it now. So it was sometime an internal transfer. So this, been, this is property has been uh, under the same beneficial owner for years. Um, so complaints, even if they go back, are essentially coming back uh, to the same person. Um, the, my client has complained multiple times, three or four times about noisy parties um, at this location. Um, now, just today, I went to look on online in the, the planning department, and I found a document called Complaints Filed with Town of Amherst on Properties Owned by Kilrain Properties LLC, prepared by the planning department staff, dated October 21, 2021. Um, it shows an enormous amount of complaints on properties that are owned and managed by these by the applicant in the same management company. Um, it looks like um, there were 14 properties owned as of, if, if the planning department's records are accurate, there were 14 properties owned um, and eight um, of, um, and 11 of them have complaints and eight of the 11 have uh, noise complaints with arrests and one of them has six noise complaints, one single property. And I'm sure that these records are understated because my client has complained three or four times. And his, when you look at the record for this property, it says there's no complaints. So I believe what could be part of the confusion is that Amherst does have a particular the, um, unique registration um, um, apparatus for uh, registering um, rental properties and making complaints through there. So it may be that um, those are the only complaints that are showing up. Uh, I just wanna make it clear that there are many, many more complaints out there than are showing up. But even if you look at only the complaints referenced, these are an enormous number of complaints um, for any one property owner. Uh, I'm a landlord in Northampton, been renting to students for years. I haven't had a single complaint against any of my buildings. This is uh, 11 out of 14 eight of them with enormous numbers, one with six noise complaints and there's arrests. So um, looking at, I, I think the, the real big problem that, that I see is looking at the lease. Uh, and I understand uh, um, the applicant spokesman said that this lease is just a sample. I think we need to see what the real lease would look like because uh, on the guest um, references provisions in the lease, it's very dif different than what they said in the application. Um, they say they can have 20 people there, um, but the application says they can have eight, uh, 16 or eight, 16 people there. So that's gotta be clarified. And in the application does say that the lease says that they could be subject to, um, subject to eviction. It's gotta be stronger. I mean, the plans that they've been doing for years simply have not been working. And if in, you have uh, two provisions of your special permit, 10.383 10 and 10.385, that sp specifically talk about a noise in the neighborhood. And um, I, I'm not saying this can't be fixed, but the, the language in the lease also talks about how it's subject to eviction on a complaint to the landlord or the agent. I think many, many people are not complaining to the landlords or the agents, and they're clearly not going through the uh, administrative procedures that are set forth in the, in the bylaws of, of uh, Amherst. They're calling the cops, and those aren't all coming through. If, well, if they are, we know they're not coming through, because my client has called three times, and you just said it, says that there's no complaints, and he would testify there was. 
So, so Mr. McLaughlin, can you, yes. I didn't, I didn't impose the time limit on you because um, I thought you were the only one, but can you kind of summarize it and um, summarize your comments? Okay. We're at five minutes here. Oh, okay. Um, um, well, the biggest problem is um, the noise provisions, the guest provisions, and that the fact that, that, that the, um, there's no condition in your proposed condition that would force them to actually take action against tenants who are violating it. They're just subject to eviction and that's not working. Uh, the other issue is the parking. Let me just speak about parking real quickly. Um, the, there's eight spaces there, which I question because in the 1992 permit, it said there should only be four spaces there. So, and two of them are built within the 20 foot setback. So they better justify that maybe through um, non-conforming rights. I don't know how, but they're gonna need more parking or otherwise there's gonna be an enormous amount of on-street parking, which will be severely detrimental to the neighbors. Already, my clients see, you know, five, six, seven people parking there now with only four bedrooms. You put eight bedrooms in there, that whole street's going to be filled with guests many times. And um, just the, the plan that they have now is not going to work. Oh. You can't approve the provisions under the uh, special permit criteria because this looking at this the record from your department this is a horrible landlord he's had huge problems 11 out of 14 one with six sound complaints and arrests this is okay. they've got to do something better i'm not saying they can't do it but they have to do it much better there has to be thank more you team. thank you mr mclaughlin thank, thank you. you all right are there any other public comments Um, we have, we've got a couple here. Yep, we have uh, Killigan O'Connell. Mr. O oh, Mr. Uh, or Ms. O'Connell. Can you hear me? Yep, we can. Please identify yourself. Um, yeah, I'm Killian O'Connell. I'm, I'm the owner of that property. Um, and I just want to say that, uh, first of all, um, I strongly disagree with the prior um, uh, respondents uh, com complaints tally um, I have switched uh, property managers two and a half years ago because we were having some issues with properties. If you look at what has happened since that time our complaint tally has gone down dramatically. Alan has been very much on top of issues like that because that is a serious concern of mine. I also live in this area and run a separate business here. So it is something that is a very major concern of mine. I do not want to be known as an, a, a slum landlord, which is a name that I know gets uh, bandied around. That is a very, very uh, major concern of mine. Um, I have met one or two of the neighbors. They may not recall me, but I do some of the landscaping myself. I'm a gardener, so I've gone out and done some property management management on that particular property a number of times. I think it was to the left of the property that I met the people. They may not recall me. I may not always be memorable, but certainly I have not heard of any of these types of complaints. They've not been forwarded to me by Alan and not even by my prior property manager on this particular property. And as to having a property with six complaints, that is something that is particularly new for me to hear. And I tend to be very aware of what's going on. I just wanted to say that in my rebuttal. Thank you, Mr. O'Connell. Um, are there any other public comments? Uh, there's a uh, Mr. Alejandro. Okay, uh, okay. if you could sit. Roberto, um, should state your name and your address. Yeah, my name is Roberto Alejandro. Uh, I live at 84 uh, Pine Street. Uh, I am glad that we had this opportunity to uh, at least <coughs> address the, the zoning board. Uh, and I am glad that I, I heard the owner of the property. I haven't had the opportunity to meet him. Uh, uh, for the property management, this is just an addition uh, to the portfolio of 14 uh, properties. Uh, they plan to build a duplex, uh, meaning more spaces, um, more tenants, um, presumably more income and taxes. For my wife and I uh, at 84 Pine Street, this is our only property. This is our home. We bought the land in 1994 and we built a brand new 
house when the community or the area was much uh, quiet. Uh, I talk on the assumption that the regulations and procedures that you are uh, representing, defending and enforcing uh, concerning construction um, uh, of new units, those regulations are meant to, to, to establish a balance, uh, to balance a new construction and the quality of life of existing owners, taxpayers, uh, and neighbors. And in this case, I am sure uh, that there will be more noise, more traffic, and it is not possible to say what was said about the prior project on the agenda, that it will be of benefit uh, to the community. Because as recently as last year, I was seeing probably seven uh, vehicles in an area that today I learned is designed for four uh, vehicles. But I understand the uh, necessities of more housing. I, I myself, I am a professor at the University of Massachusetts. I have been here in Amherst since 1989. I love this community. It is just that by increasing uh, the area, the living area of this property, I don't know frankly how to interpret that. And I don't know whether the permission if granted and all the signs apparently point in direction mean for my wife and I that another message that we should probably join the movement and sell the house and transform our house into a rental property. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alejandro. Um, Councilor Pam, I see your hand is up. Could you state your name and your address? Uh, Pam 229 Amity Street. Go ahead, Ms. Pam. You are on mute. You should be able to speak. We can't hear you if you are speaking. Oh, I am speaking. Okay. Can, can, you, can you hear me now? Yep, yep, we can hear you. Okay. So I'll start again that I, I want to applaud the planning board for starting to keep records of complaints on housing. And I remember that um, building superintendent Rob Morris said to a previous um, builder that he wanted copies of the complaints that he had received, that there's an effort now to keep tabs on problem buildings, because we know that there will be buildings that will rent to students. And if they're properly managed, that can be um, done without destroying neighborhoods. But if it's not properly done, um, and if records aren't kept, and if truth isn't told, then it'll result in what you've just heard. People saying, I can't live like this. I can't live with nothing but cars and noise next door. I thought this was a family neighborhood. So um, I'm hoping that the effort to keep records on the town part, to really make them accurate, and to use them when necessary will continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pam. Um, any other? It looks like uh, Attorney McLaughlin has raised his hand again. Mm -hmm. All right, well, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, uh, we, you, you know, we normally do three minutes. We've given you six. Is there something new that you want to discuss? And if so, can you keep it to less than three minutes? Um, um, I, I am pressing. Um, can you, yep. it can like you hear me? Yes. Yep. Okay, so you, thank you. Yeah. You heard my request and my, uh, if it's something that you haven't already spoken to, go ahead, but please keep it to about three minutes. Yes, uh, it's just uh, actually a point of order. I've given you the proof of what I have said. I've now sent an email of your records. These are planning department records showing the numbers of complaints on the applicant's property as of October of 2021. It's a five page document, your records. Um, I, unfortunately with a PDF and I have highlighted sections of it. So I'm not stating that the highlighted section uh, is your records, but um, 
I ask the board to at least consider these records and see if there is something that could be done with the management plan other than just approve it again and add more uh, violations to the pages of records of violations they have. Um, okay. I, I, would, I would ask that they consider this and we have another hearing to consider this again. I hope you don't close the hearing tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. All right. I see no other uh, comments from the hands up from the public. Um, our procedure is to allow the applicant to respond to the public comments. Um, Mr. St. Hilaire, do you wish to, to respond to the comments you heard? If so, please would. direct your comments to us and not to them. I, I would like to respond, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, one thing that I would like to clarify uh, when the, the comment was made about the, the number of occupants currently under the laws and regulations, both health and building code, we're allowed to have six residents at the property, four in the front, two in the rear. Uh, we're only asking to increase that by two. So we're going from six residents to eight residents. Um, I'd also like to point out uh, as professional property managers that we receive an email from Officer Laramie every Monday morning and uh, it, it outlines the noise complaints uh, townwide. And we review those reports every Monday. And if there are any complaints against our properties, we do take action on those. Uh, we are a professional management company. I think that uh, Attorney McLaughlin kind of painted us in a bad light. Um, I believe that if you look at the volume of properties we manage, uh, it is statistically consistent with the uh, resident body townwide. I don't think that we are doing a particularly poor job as compared to other owners. While there may be a, a higher number of complaints, he referenced the number of complaints across our company or across uh, Killerine's ownership, uh, that, that is uh, consistent with you know, the number of properties that we're handling. I don't think that it's exemplary of you know poor management style. Uh, I'd also like to point out that the abutter immediately to the west has a completely opposite viewpoint. Uh, they sent in a written comment that says that we've been great neighbors and that they've got no complaints and that um, you know they're they're happy to have us as a New England style neighbor. Um, I. Lastly, would just like to add that uh, this is the first time I've heard from the abutter to the to the right to the east. Uh, if there were complaints, they were never brought to our attention. Uh, our contact information is readily available through the rental registration program. Uh, we are also uh, regularly contacted if there is an issue by the police department. If we have an issue to resolve, uh, Officer Laramie's role is to be the neighborhood outreach and kind of moderate between property owners and other residents in the town. Um, and as to the comment of this being kind of a bucolic family neighborhood, I would like to point out that this is a main artery to North Amherst, to Leverett, to uh, parts of Shutesbury, and there are in fact multiple properties up and down Pine Street that are uh, multifamily, non-owner occupied. Um, you know, I can go into specifics. We did provide that with the application, but this is not uh, kind of a white picket fence, single family only neighborhood. It is a, a, a mixture of um, both owner occupied and non-owner occupied uh, housing. Uh, lastly, um, you know, the, the uh, abutter to the east mentioned that he built this house in 1994 and thought that it was a nice family neighborhood. I uh, would like to point out that this property has been a duplex approved by the town since 1992. Uh, so the use of the duplex predates his occupancy uh, as an abutter. And I believe that covers the points I would like to cover. Maureen, do we have copies of um, the lease? Yes, it was, it? it was provided to you um, yeah. electronically. Um, oh, electronically. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add on the subject of the lease, uh, it sounds like there was a claim made that our lease is inconsistent. I did pull that up while we were hearing the public comment and on page three, uh, section L, or excuse me, section M, uh, it refers the limit on gatherings to the guest policy. And I believe the guest policy does spell out very clearly 
um, what our restrictions are, and those were even reviewed in the project application report to be appropriate. Would I say something? Uh, please wait for the chair to call on you. Mr. Alejandro, is it something that you um, that you have not spoken to in your previous comment? Yeah, it is just a brief reaction to what the gentleman said about our community. He's not a neighbor here. And I would like to say something about that. Yeah, uh, do it within three minutes, please. Yeah, uh, in, 19, in 1992, the house was occupied by the owner and he, uh, her son and her uh, mother. That was the, the occupation rate at the moment. It was a bucolic community in 1992, 1994. Uh, that is not, unfortunately, the plans that some developers have for uh, Pine Street. I can count between seven and nine properties that are owner occupied. And I live in the area and probably there are more. Some of the houses have in-laws apartment, but the owner is there and he's responsible for the conduct uh, the, of whatever happens in the premises. And last, I don't want to have problems with students. I prefer to call the police and just to make a complaint, not to go through the administrative procedures that now I learned are in place in, in Amherst. Thank you, Mr. Alejandro. Um, if there's no other uh, comments, we're going to close off public comments. Um, and I'd like to open it up to board to the board to um, discuss what we um, the general feeling about this application. Um, and then we can move to the conditions and findings uh, if we feel ready to or if we need for additional information. Um, we can respond, request that. Um, Mr. Meadows, I think I, I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, I, I have um, a little confusion in the sense that it was stated that the property is uh, available for six, um, what, six bedrooms or six spaces. I'm not exactly certain. Uh, and they're asking for an additional four. Uh, and at the moment it has, Four in the front and one in the back, am I correct? One in the back uh, and three in the front, right? Yeah, so so uh, to repeat, there's two what? units currently on the property. The unit A, which is the front unit, has three bedrooms. And unit B, which is in the rear, is a one bedroom unit. And uh, the applicant is proposing to modify and expand these two dwelling units and so each, both dwelling units would be four bedrooms each. So there would be a total of eight bedrooms as, as opposed to the existing bed, total bedroom um, would be what, what three and one is four. Four, okay. four sorry, yeah. All right. Four. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied with the uh, plot plan that we've had, we have indicating the parking spaces, the allocation of parking spaces, um, it, it's a little blurry as far as I'm concerned uh, and vague. Um, and if the uh, regulation that I was stating is imposed, I'd like to know where and, uh, and how that's going to be imposed. Uh, I'd also like to see how the bicycle racks are gonna be uh, placed, the storage is gonna be placed. Uh, the, it, it seems as though this application is not very well put together. And I'm also uh, uh, I'm also inclined to listen to the abutters quite a bit. I would like to uh, myself. I'd like to see the the lease specific for the properties proposed. Um, and I think this the lease is a sample lease or, or that has to be adjusted. So I'd like to see the specific lease for the property. Um, and I I know we have what we have online. It, I, I don't see it, Maureen. I'm, I, is it, I, I'm looking on the, the space right now, the uh, website, and I don't see, I see the stuff for 15. Uh, it's uh, under um, the 16, uh, ZBA FY 22-16, the application packet. Um, that. 
Okay. Uh, you could be right. Uh, um, let me, I'm just, uh, you know, but, but I think it, I, I yeah. you know, this is probably something in the best possible situation here would be to give us a little more time to review the, the lease, review the parking. We could, um, and other, if we have other questions, we could, uh, put, we could give them to the applicant and get questions answered. Uh, and I also like the clarification. It seems to me that the complaint report that we had showed a, um, a, a difference between when it was managed by Valley Management, by Mr. St. Hilaire's firm, and somebody who managed it before. And I'm confused as to the, um, the complaint history there, but I'd like to also clear that up. Um, in case, you, unless you can clear that up right now, um, I think that requires some some clarity in my point, uh, from my point of view. But so those are two two issues that I think are out there. Um, we're going to get to you in just a second, Mr. Sanger. I want to catch up, see if other board members have comments or questions. Ms. Parks or Mr. Gilbert or Mr. Maxfield. None particularly. I'm just echoing what Mr. Meadows had stated previously. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. Ms. Parks. Um, I I guess I would like some clarification on the parking. So is it is the parking for four cars? I think it's for eight cars. Okay. Yeah. Two pre yeah eight cars. So there'd be four four parking spaces per unit. So right. one parking space per bedroom. Okay. I guess I just I don't I didn't see that anywhere. Um, Mr. Maxfield. Right. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I, uh, I mean, I think I'm definitely going to want a little bit of time to review some of the, uh, the complaints, uh, and to, to look at what has been said here tonight, to actually see if I can review some of this material. So I, I definitely don't think I'm, I'm ready to make a decision on this one tonight. Um, I don't know if it's something the board could or should suggest. I'll ask, you know, your thoughts on this, Mr. Chair. I just know in the previous application that we had dealt with earlier today, um, I know uh, Mr. Roberts had spoken directly to residents outside of CBA meetings to try to come to a consensus before bringing something to us. I don't know if we'd want to make a, any sort of suggestion about the, the butter property management maybe trying to see what these issues are and then reaching some sort of consensus, or if that's something that we would want to do in a meeting. I know that it, it creates um, trying to work these things out in this format can be a little bit difficult where everyone has to direct their, their uh, comments to the chair in a three minute format. Um, maybe that's, that's something that I, where I'm saying, I don't, I don't want to make a decision on this tonight. Maybe the rest of the board feels differently, but if that gives them two weeks to maybe say, get a chance to, get in touch with each other, talk about that and see if that is something that can be resolved that when it comes back to us, hey, these are conditions we would like to see and then could make all of our, um, could make it a little bit easier on everybody here. I don't know if that's something you, you, you would recommend, Mr. Judge, or if you think that's a bad idea. You know, I, I, it's not something I'd recommend that we um, facilitate, but I think just your comment um, is enough to, to inform the applicant that is probably be a, a good idea to, to reach out and admit, but I don't think that's a, a I don't think we have a forum for doing that outside of the public meetings but I think your comment is is probably a wise one and something that would make sense and we've seen work in other other situations so I uh, thank you for that um Mr. Meadows did you want to raise do you have another comment I thought I saw you raise your hand or might have just no, been the, the only other comment you. was I, I, I know given the distance that I am at, I, I did not get a comprehensive package yeah. and, uh, and, and everything came in today. So there was not enough time to study it in any depth. And uh, I certainly would need considerably more time to study yeah. the pack, a package. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think we should, I agree with that. And I think that we should, um, Try to pull a whole package together, Maureen, get it in paper to, to us early next as early as possible and think about doing this in two weeks. If we can put it on the next agenda, I don't want to unduly delay this, the consideration of this one way or the other, but uh, what's as soon as 
what's the quickest we can have it given notice requirements? Well, we would be, uh, I, I'm, I would recommend that the board continue this public hearing um, to a date and time certain. Yeah. Um, and so the next available time would be at the July 14th meeting, Thursday, July 14th. Yeah. And that meeting is at six o'clock. Okay. And I, so that we can satisfy notice requirements and all that at that time. Okay. And then the other thing I would do is, is I thought the way in which we handled some of these issues in um, the previous application where the, the um, management company, the owner, the applicant agreed to provide certain information back to the town and recording violations and maybe a template for what we can would be good something good to study in, in, other, in future cases. I think it worked out pretty well for the prior applicant and I think it helped us. So I'd encourage, I'd, I'd like to ask Mr. St. Hilaire to look to, um, I guess it would be condition, and you can share this with him, Maureen, condition um, 47 and 40, 46 and 47, which talk about reporting back on an annual basis and making available to the building commissioner uh, complaint histories. So that would be helpful to take a look at that, Mr. St. Hilaire, and that would be something that might be helpful because it gives us um, more information, something that's valuable for the town to have, and it also is a is a, a, a record that can be um, accessed on a yearly annual basis to evaluate um, problems for the town. So I think it'd be good if you'd look at that. But I'm in a position also, like the brother board members, that I'm not prepared to approve it yet. Um, so I'd like, to, I'd like to have the lease specific for this property. I'd like to see some of the parking more de delineated um, I think the um, also the, the the estate hybrid or the, Mr. Meadows point for the, the I think that should be answered, and I think we could probably do that by the 14th of, of July, and we could consider this at that point. Um, but Mr. Saint Hilaire, you had um, some you wanted to make some responses to the public comment and maybe to what we said, and then and I think the board should uh, should move one way or the other. Go ahead. I would thank you for the opportunity. Um, Mr. Meadows mentioned that he didn't see anything uh, that addressed bicycle storage and trash storage, which I would like to clarify because it is on our site plan that we provided. Uh, so I'll share my screen for that uh, now just to clarify that. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to clarify the parking. Uh, so uh, on the site plan, You'll see uh, a call out here, and I'll admit it is way off to the right, but if you follow that call out, the, the bike rack is shown here to the east of the existing uh, property. And this is something that we have seen on prior uh, special permit requests, and of course have included that to satisfy that. Uh, also, you'll see the trash and recycling bins called out. And for clarity, this is uh, sheet L2 on the provided site plan. Uh, so the trash and recycling bins, there'll be four uh, small 96 gallon poly rolling carts that will not be a dumpster. Uh, this has proven to be appropriate uh, across our management portfolio for properties of this size. And they are uh, hidden from public view in the uh, elbow of the property here. Uh, as for the parking, um, we are showing, you know, four spaces on the easterly side of the parking area, four spaces on the westerly side of the parking area. They are dimensions. Uh, this, this plan was put together by a surveyor, uh, a Massachusetts uh, licensed surveyor, and it was stamped. Um, so I'm, I'm a little unclear on what additional uh, clarification is being requested of the parking other than the, the, the site survey, which is showing, you know, the eight existing spaces uh, for the west, for the east, with the dimensions uh, as surveyed. Um, and uh, just to clarify, uh, I believe the uh, Mr. McLaughlin, Attorney McLaughlin, uh, made the statement that the uh, the current owner 
extends prior to 2018. That is incorrect. This owner uh, has only owned it since 2018. They were different. And it, this isn't just a matter of legal entities. He, he had no ownership of this property prior to 2018. Uh, and the complaints uh, that were researched by staff uh, were, were, there were no complaints after he took ownership. So um, I don't believe there's any complaints on the property. Uh, if, if Attorney McLaughlin has differing information, certainly we can take a look at that. Um, but any complaints on the property that predate this owner don't seem to be germane to uh, this proposal, in my opinion. Um, and uh, it, just to clarify also, Mr. Meadows seemed to have some confusion on the configuration of the property. Uh, and what I had pointed out was unit A, uh, legally we can have four occupants and unit B, we can legally have two occupants. Uh, so that's a total of six occupants. And yes, the, the building count, the, the bedroom count is increasing. Uh, but the occupant count is only going up by two. And if the if the neighbor concern is more people, more noise, more cars, uh, it's only increasing by 25%. So looking at the number of bedrooms uh, kind of paints a more bleak picture, but the reality is the number of occupants is what's going to have any particular impact on the property. Um, All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sandler. Um, any further comments from the board? If not, I'm I'm ready to we're approaching nine o'clock and I'm ready to, to entertain a motion that we um, continue this matter until six o'clock on June 14th or July 14th. Um, and we take it up at that point. Um, Mr. Chair, it looks like yep. uh, the property owner, we're, Milligan uh, Connell, would like to. We're like, we're on, we're beyond that now. We're okay. we're in a motion to we're in a motion to proceed. Uh, we have a motion before us. That motion is to um, continue this until June July fourteenth at six o'clock at our next meeting. Do I have a second? So moved. Second. Uh, any discussion? If not, it's a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. Great. Uh, we now have uh, that matter is settled. We're moving this, we're continuing it until the next meeting. The next order of business is public comment on any matter not before us tonight. So any matter except for the two applications we had on the, uh, the, the docket for tonight. So if you do wish to comment, please raise your hand. Um, keep your comments to three minutes. I see none. The next order of business is uh, any unfinished business or anything that did not come up before. Um, that amongst board members, I don't see anything. Oh. Ms. Pollock. Um, yeah, so actually, and I forgot to bring this up to you, Steve, but I brought it up at the last meeting. Um, so the planning department um, would like to uh, um, change the legal ad uh, fee. Currently it's $75. And so for each public hearing, um, under uh, state regulations, a legal ad needs to be placed in the Daily Hampshire Gazette twice, two weeks before the public hearing date and one week prior to the meeting date. Um, the legal ads are so much higher than $75. Um, and so the planning department um, really needs to increase those fees. The planning board recently approved um, their legal ads to go up to, I believe, $300. Um, and so the planning department would like to mimic the planning board's uh, fee increase. And um, under the ZBA rules and regulations, um, it's, it states that, you know, 
the 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 ZBA needs to if any regulate if any um, changes are made to the rules and regulations that the that the ZBA needs to approve those and that would need to be done at a public hearing. So we're going to um, ask that the ZBA hold a public hearing to review changing the legal ad fees as well as reviewing the rules and regulations in general um, to see if there's any other changes that um, we may find. Uh, I recently find a couple um, um, confusing sentences that I personally will recommend, um, but um, I just wanted to make that aware to you all that we'll, we would like to add that to a, a future meeting agenda. Great. And I guess when you do, um, yeah, there are other town boards and committees that require public notice, like the planning board and the um, ZBA. The Conservation Commission also uh, under uh, Ch MGL Chapter 40A, uh, uh, I, their chapter might be different for the ComCom, but uh, under state regulations, the Conservation Commission also needs to provide legal ads. Um, so we just fill us in what, when we do have this meeting, fill us on what the other situations are with the other, if we're doing this across the board or whatever. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah that, as a let us know. You know. We don't want to be outliers, but um, certainly the subsidizing uh, notice for development is a, it's costly and we should, it be, is, yeah. we should be giving it some serious thought. Yeah, and it's not unique to Amherst. Every yeah. um, community is 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 kind of grappling with with legal ads and sort of the whole structure of how um, noticing um, noticing these legal ads. Um, they have to under uh, state law. They need to be done in a printed newspaper, as opposed to online. And so we can't that's, do it on TikTok, that's where right? they get you. <laughs> we can't do it on TikTok. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> All right, I <laughs> just think with that, Kim Kardashian does public notices for ZBA or whatever. I can't imagine. Anyway, thank you, Maureen. We'll put it on the next, if you prepare, we can do it for this, the 14th. Um, yeah. And then lastly, what other items do we have coming up? We do. Um, we actually, there. I can't remember the exact proposal, but there is another special permit application for 485 Pine Street, and it might be for a non-owner occupied duplex or something similar to that. Uh, I, can't, I can't exactly remember at the top of my head, um, but that is going to be scheduled for July 14th. Okay. Well, if that's going to be scheduled for July 14th, maybe a, um, a map of the area and the, the type of houses for 485 Pine Street and along Pine Street might be helpful. So we know what the uses are and we can compare that as opposed to just uh, assertions from both the applicant as well as neighbors. Maybe we could have the, uh, a map that shows us exactly what's going on. That's all right, good. all that's good. Anything else from the members? If not, I'd like- Just, just wanted to mention, I'm gonna send you an email, Maureen. Um, next, uh, the next meeting's good. The 28th, I'm gonna be away um, without uh, access to internet, so. I know the not 4th of July. 20th. Not available on uh, July 20th. All right, cool. Um, all right, thank you for letting me know. And and um, yeah, so actually folks, if you could take a look at your sort of hopefully summer vacation schedule, um, let me know if, if, if any of these meeting dates don't work. Again, the ZBA meets the second, fourth Thursday of each month. Yep, looks like things are picking up. Ms. Parks. Oh. Um, I'll be in New Hampshire on the 14th, but I can attend the meeting, but if I can get the materials uh, earlier, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. That's good to know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Enforce the seven day rule, Maureen, on the applicants. I mean, be, be strict on it because it really makes a difference on for all of us. It makes a huge difference. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, have a great week. Have a great two weeks, and we'll talk to you on the 14th. Thank you. Thank you. Motion Thank to you. adjourn. Oh, motion oh. to adjourn is coming. Mm -hmm. There's a second. Second. Uh, and you just got, well, there is no discussion on this motion. So, um, uh, Chair votes aye. 
Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. It's unanimous and it's 9 01. Okay. Pretty good timing. All right, guys. All right. Motion passed. We are adjourned. See y'all later. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank you.